Hi, listeners. This is the 80,000 Hours Podcast, where each week we have an unusually in-depth conversation about one of the world's most pressing problems and how you can use your career to solve it. I'm Rob Wiblin, Director of Research at 80,000 Hours. Before we get to today's episode, I just wanted to mention a few articles that 80,000 Hours has released recently. I'll put links to these in the show notes and blog posts associated with this episode. And if you want to skip this section, just jump ahead a minute or two. Last week, we launched a career review of working as a congressional staffer, which covers the impact you might expect to have, various other pros and cons, and what are indicators that it's a good personal fit for you. If you could see yourself pursuing a career in US politics, you should definitely check it out. A few weeks ago, I wrote up a summary of a randomized control trial that found people who were on the fence about whether to quit their jobs or make other changes to their lives, and then advised some of them to make the change and others to stay the course. It found that in general, people who changed their lives as a result of this advice were happier six months later. The write-up goes into a lot more detail, and you should certainly read it before taking action on, on this kind of basis. You might have heard about a paper published two weeks ago reporting on the results of an effort to replicate 21 psychology papers published in the best journals to figure out which effects were real and which weren't. I made a quiz that describes the results of these 21 papers and invites you to guess whether that particular effect replicated or not. It's pretty fun, and so far 6,000 people have finished using it. We're collecting data on what kinds of people have the most accurate guesses, which we'll write up soon. So if you can go and fill out that quiz and then give us some information about yourself, you'll be helping with that effort. Finally, just yesterday, we published a new and quite advanced article on whether or not it's important to focus on finding your comparative advantage relative to other people in your professional community. As I said, there's links to those three articles and the quiz in the show notes and the blog post attached to the show. All right, here's Amanda. Today, I'm speaking with Amanda Askell. Amanda recently completed a PhD in philosophy at NYU, one of the world's top philosophy grad schools, with a thesis focused on infinite ethics. Before that, she did a BPhil at Oxford University, with her thesis being focused on objective epistemic consequentialism. Quite a mouthful. (laughs) She's been involved in the effective altruism community since its inception and blogs at rationalreflection.net. Thanks for coming on the podcast, Amanda. Thank you for having me. So we plan to talk a bunch about your philosophy research Mm -hmm. and I guess your views on philosophy PhDs and academic careers in general. But first, you you finished your PhD defense a couple of weeks ago, right? Uh, Yeah, last week. Okay, yeah. How did you find the the PhD experience? I think, is it six years you've spent at NYU? Six and a half years, I think, altogether. Um. (laughs) I mean, I've heard that PhDs in the US are pretty painful. Is, Is that kind of your experience? I think it depends on your disposition. In some ways, I think I'm maybe not uh, the perfect disposition for a PhD. You have to be able to focus on many things at once um, if you want to kind of get a lot out of the program, I think. Mm -hmm. I tend to be much more kind of singular in my thinking. And so I find it a little bit hard to spread my research across like multiple topics. Whereas in the US, you often start out by doing kind of many topics and then eventually focusing in on the thesis. I thought the challenge that most people had was focusing in their PhD because they want to kind of graze intellectually, but then they have to spend potentially years just getting to the forefront of one particular topic. I think it depends on the kind of person you are. So some people have this kind of magical ability to do a PhD and at the same time produce like many different kinds of research while they're like doing their thesis. And I think I always saw that and thought, oh, that's what I want to do. I want to be the kind of person that just like produces many things while I'm like doing my PhD. And then I found towards the end that it was like, actually, if I want to like get this PhD finished and do the research, I have to really just focus on this one thing. Hmm. Um, So some people have this ability to like focus on multiple things, but I at least don't have a problem with like just focusing in on, on, on a single research topic. It's just that I wish I could kind of multitask in a way that I seem unable to. Yeah. I think you seem like one of the most conscientious people I know. Uh, is this a potential downside of that? I'm trying to find any justification for my lack of conscientiousness. This feels like surprising to me because I think I'm like, I can be conscientious about work, but uh, this can also mean kind of neglecting things uh, in ways that other people don't. So I can be very non-conscientious about emails, for example, um, yeah. as a result of this. So I just trade off. I just take conscientiousness from one area <laughs> and I like erase it <laughs> and then I apply this to some other area, like my research. Um, so that's how I work. I'm, I'm like, I have a pool of conscientiousness and 
Uh, I have lots of emails that I haven't responded to. I think like most of the philosophers that I know uh, seem that they, they, they really fit the philosopher stereotype of kind of a bit having the, their heads in the clouds. Uh, yeah. They're perhaps like quite bad at life admin, you know, like filing their taxes and answering their emails and uh, yeah. buying food and cleaning their room. Uh, yeah. like, I guess you seem, you seem a bit like that. Yes, I'm very like that. Do you think there's like a, a systematic reason why philosophers have to be that way? I think that you have to carve out a space for research. So the kind of intense research that is involved both in PhDs, but also, you know, later in research jobs just needs kind of single minded focus on one topic. And I just find that if I'm having to think about other things, uh, it just divides my attention. And so I compartmentalize really heavily. You know, so I'm the kind of person where I'm like, you know, I completely get rid of my emails. Like I'll just like snooze all of them until until a given task is done. And I think if you don't have that space, it's just like you can't get to that point where you can just like focus fully on this like very difficult problem in front of you. So I think it's that that people are kind of, yeah, inclined to just get rid of the other stuff um, in order to like focus on problems. So having finished your PhD, are you glad that you started it in the first place? Oh, that's that is a tough question. I think in retrospect, I'm unsure whether I would do a PhD again, uh, where I faced with the same choice that I had, say, like six or seven years ago. Mainly not because I haven't enjoyed the program and not because I haven't learned a lot. It's just a huge time investment. And it's a time investment in the case of philosophy that's quite singularly focused on like one outcome. Namely, people are mainly focused on getting academic jobs. Um, It's somewhat unusual for people to do other things. And so if you have any uncertainty about whether that's what you want to do, it can be quite risky. Um, And given the way that the job market is at the moment, it can be quite risky, uh, even if you think that that's definitely what you want to do. So I'm not sure that I, yeah, I'm basically not sure that I would do it over again and perhaps not in the topics that I chose to focus on. Okay, well, we'll come back to talking about yeah, philosophy as a career track and what you're going to do next uh, later on in the, in the episode. But for now, I want to move on to uh, the, the issue of moral cluelessness. Yes. Uh, so what is, what is that problem? Yeah, so cluelessness is this problem that arises when you're trying to make an ethical decision And they're kind of immediate ramifications to your actions that you can just understand quite well. So, you know, I can distribute, you know, 20 malaria nets in this region and I can estimate like the impact that that will have in terms of like malaria um, for those people. But there are lots of effects of your actions that are just very difficult to predict. So, you know, an example is you save the life of a woman and you don't realize that the child she is carrying is going to like grow up to be a terrible dictator who like murders many people. So this was just a very, you know, unforeseen consequence of the action of like saving the woman. Similarly, like you could save someone whose child like grows up to like save billions of people, but it was an unforeseen consequence of the act of like saving the woman, which in and of itself only like kind of uh, the direct impact of it was just saving that woman um, and uh, saving her unborn child. And the worry about this is essentially you might think, well, maybe things just kind of cancel out. You know, so I have action A, which is helping the women, action B, which is not. It's just very obvious that I should help the women. I'm inclined to like agree with that. And so you say, well, she could have given birth to this person who ends up, you know, like being a terrible dictator, but she also could have given birth to this person who like saves like millions of lives. And so these these probabilities of these kind of outlier events kind of cancel out. The the problem of like cluelessness or like a kind of novel problem of cluelessness that um like has been talked about by like Hilary Greaves, for example, is that in some cases it doesn't seem like we can use this kind of principle of indifference. So it could be that um my actions have kind of like ongoing ramifications that are simply not foreseen, but I don't have any reason to think that they're equal across both of my actions. You know, so you think about the the consequences of having this like huge impact in a in a country by like, you know, donating a huge amount of money and like affecting its economy and affecting its people. And um, there might be kind of like consistent impacts of that action that are uh, not such that I can just think, oh yeah, and it's equally likely that that wouldn't have happened or that the opposite would have happened. Mm-hmm. Um, rather, it's just like, I don't know. Um, and so the problem of cluelessness is something like, I shouldn't necessarily think that there's equal probabilities of these kind of outlier effects or unintended effects, but nor do I have really any information uh, to go on about like the likelihood or otherwise of like these good you know, long-term effects versus these negative long-term effects. 
And so it's this real worry about just like our degree of uncertainty about like the long term unintended or indirect impact of our actions. So for this to be a real problem, does it have to be the case that these long term or indirect effects are much larger than the direct effect, that they're likely to swamp it? I'm not sure if it's necessary for the problem. I'm trying to think about whether you could generate a smaller version of the problem. I think it's like likely that this is like what's generating the key worry is just that consequences of my actions are actually just quite likely to be large as well. Because when we think about the fact that this was like the, the causal chain that you're setting off when you undertake an action like intervening in another country is not one where you actually expect the ramifications to be kind of small. Um, it's one where you, you do expect a, a kind of important long-term impact. Mm. And you might not be sure about the sign of that impact if you think that uh, these, you know, there are these unforeseen outcomes that are like quite negative and quite positive um, and that you just, you know, don't really have enough information to be able to see how likely they are. So I think the presupposition is more that almost all of the outcomes are fairly large. Yeah. And we're really, you know, as soon as you get into the, like, you know, further beyond like a few years from now, you start to be really uncertain about like, what they look like. Yeah. Uh, I wonder if it's worth pointing out how easy it would be for saving a single life to potentially change the entire course of history. Like that this is not yes. only possible, but perhaps even like probable. Yeah. Uh, that it could like completely change the identities of all people in like future generations. Well, yeah, a super fun, I think it, it gets called the ancestors paradox. So that's essentially that, uh, think about how many grandparents you have and how many great grandparents you have. And imagine that tree branching outwards. Um, and it gets bigger and bigger as you go back in the generations. And I imagine the number of people who have existed in history, it gets like narrower and na narrower and narrower. You know, our population has just been has been increasing. So as you go into the past, it actually decreases. And obviously the reason for this is that there's like a lot of overlap um, between relations. Um, you know, so maybe it's the case that your great, great, great grandparent is also your like, you know, great, great, great something else. Yeah. And because of this, if you go far enough back in history, you can say if this person had any living descendants, then they are in fact the ancestor of everyone on, on earth. And this is like a kind of really interesting effect when you think about it going forward, because it, you should expect the same thing. So like one person, if they have living descendants far into the future, will in fact be the ancestor of everyone. So changing who they give birth to or changing whether they have children um, and whether they have living descendants can actually change the entire population of the world hmm. um, in the future. And so identities of agents are actually super delicate, basically. Hmm. And so, yes, like if you save the life of one person, they go on to have children and have children's children, etc. There's a really good chance you've just changed the identity of like everyone who exists, every, the, the entire population of humans that exist in the future, which is like very interesting. But it's an example of how the causal ramifications of your actions can actually be like fairly massive. Hmm. And, and also extremely unpredictable. Uh, and very unpredictable, yeah. yeah. Are there different forms of cluelessness that, that we should worry about? The, the different kind of classifications? The main uh, classification that I'm aware of is this kind of like, this new puzzle of cluelessness uh, versus this kind of uh, the original puzzle, where the new puzzle is pointing out that uh, it's very difficult to use the principle of indifference in some of these cases. Specifically, you know, I think the example used is like effective altruism, where you expect to have a uh, large and fairly consistent effect. So they're not merely, um, you know, it's not merely like what's the possibility that uh, this woman gives birth to a dictator versus that uh, she gives birth to like uh, someone fantastic. And maybe you think that you should just use a principle of indifference because, you know, the person could have been a dictator or they could have been, you know, a real benefit to, to humanity, but rather that they have consistent effects but we just don't know about them. So that was like a kind of unpredictable outcome versus one that is like a consistent outcome of your action that you shouldn't think it was equally likely uh, that the opposite act outcome would have happened. So, you know, in changing a population, you know, in improving the lives right now of a population and therefore changing like everything about like the future economy of that country, that will in fact either be like kind of good or bad for that country. But you shouldn't just say, oh, well, you know, 50-50, it could either be good, could either be bad. But rather you, you, if you investigated, would find reasons for thinking, for thinking that like it's more likely to be good than bad. But right now you just have like complete uncertainty about which is the case. But for it to matter, it has to kind of be possible or you either have to believe already that it's either probably positive or negative or it has to be possible for you to find out right yeah so so if you think that the principle of indifference isn't true here that's a principle that lets you just kind of assign really precise values to kind of outcomes and just say well you know i have this really you know very positive outcome and this really very negative outcome both of them are possible and i'm going to assign them the same probability if you think that this 
cluelessness problem is like a real problem. One thing you might say is like, I just can't assign probabilities to these uh, outcomes, um, given my current evidence. And in that case, um, you should perhaps try to use something like imprecise probabilities and or probability intervals or something like that. Wouldn't you always just have some kind of credence, some kind of probability attached to each outcome? Well, or, or you, you want to move away from this uh, like simple Bayesianism? I mean, I, I like this. And I the, the question mainly here is like, can we say that it's actually rational, like what, okay. what we're doing? And so, you know, one possible response to this is actually you do have reasons and we're not merely appealing to a principle of indifference, but rather we are thinking about all of the possible long-term ramifications of our actions given our current evidence and we're using that to make decisions. Mm. Um, and we're going to try and like discover more about what those uh, long-term ramifications are. So I think if you do it within a kind of precise framework, you would probably just end up denying that we're reasoning using the principle of indifference and you would try and say, no, we actually have like evidence about uh, these long-term outcomes and we either are or should be taking it into account. And the major update that we get from the problem of cluelessness is that we should really be trying to figure out more what the long-term ramifications of our actions are, because the fact that we can even look at cases like this and be unsure about the effects that our actions will have in like 70 years is like fairly bad, you know, because it could be that there are just these things that we could gain evidence about that are at the moment unforeseen and that are like going to negatively impact future populations. Yeah. So what's this principle of indifference? So that's the, the principle that says take the really bad outcome, like the outcome where the agent was like a, you know, a terrible despot. Yeah. And then the kind of this other outcome, which seems uh, also kind of implausible, which is that they are going to like, you know, save humanity from like, you know, something terrible and save millions of people. Um, just cancel them out. Yeah, I don't really have one reason. I don't have more reason to think that, that their child is going to be a terrible despot than I do to think that they're going to save the world. And so like, sure, like, let's just say that these effects uh, just get kind of cancelled out. I'm just indifferent between them. So I've heard people in the past say that this this issue of being totally unable to predict the long term consequences of, of, of your actions uh, shows that like consequentialism is wrong or is yeah. like very problematic. And I've even heard people say, because no one even thinks about this, that just shows that no one really is a consequentialist, yeah. uh, which is kind of amusing, I guess, given given how much the effective altruism community stresses about this. Yeah. Uh, what do you think of those arguments? Yeah, so do I think it's a problem for consequentialism? One thing that's worth noting is this is a problem that arises in, you know, maybe this is a philosopher's point, but it's a problem that arises in, in the context of making decisions rather than in the context of like ranking actions. Mm. So some people are going to think of consequentialism as a theory that's more about how you should rank actions given their actual outcomes. And in that case, cluelessness doesn't arise because it's specifically a problem about uncertainty. But you might think that it's a problem for people who want to try to kind of internalize a kind of consequentialist decision procedure. You know, they're really trying to work out what the best action for them to undertake is if consequentialism is true. And it turns out that that's like really hard, or if not impossible to do. I'm inclined to think that it is a problem uh, if we can't use principles to be able to like actually give kind of well-defined expected values to, to outcomes. I suppose I'm more optimistic in the case of cluelessness that we can, like given our evidence, give kind of more precise uh, estimates of like how good the outcomes are. It seems more like a practical problem than an in principle problem. Uh, yeah, I think even if right. it's a very challenging uh, practical problem. Yeah, I think that's how I kind of, you know, and maybe other people kind of uh, perceive it differently, but that's like how I kind of perceive the cluelessness problem. Hmm. I suppose you could imagine us constructing a world in future where things are much less chaotic and much more predictable. And so the cluelessness problem somewhat goes away. Yeah, uh, yeah. And like you can just, you can, we have like a lot of evidence about long term ramifications. Hmm. You know, maybe one worry for that is going to be that even if you have a huge amount of evidence, you would need something close to omniscience because you could just have random factors that have huge causal ramifications. Mm. You know, so like we said about identity, you know, it's changing like which children, you know, someone has can like just affect the population of the entire future of humanity. You might just think what? that like random uh, events could like have have huge impacts on like the outcomes of your actions. Yeah. I mean, I suppose at the, at the very extreme end, you could just have one non-human agent that never reproduces remaining, and then it would be much easier to predict the consequences. Yeah, of we their could actions. just imagine worlds where it's like, and also there's like no, yeah, this, there's this one agent in a box uh, who is like completely separated from like the rest of the universe, and so there's no like, uh, there's just like no chancy behavior. Yeah, um, and then we can maybe like extrapolate out from that and just be like, yeah, the amount of data we would need would be huge, but like in principle, we could solve this problem by just like kind of knowing about everything that's going to happen. Yeah conditional and the different things that we can do 
So having having mapped out this issue, do you, do you think it's a, a challenge for philosophers or is it now just a challenge for kind of social scientists and economists and things like that? I think there's a key challenge of like figuring out whether we can actually have rational, precise uh, credences in these kinds of cases, especially if we reject like this kind of principle of indifference. Hmm. And if so, how we can make decisions under this form of uncertainty. And so for the people who think that you should just have imprecise credences in this case, the key challenge is going to be giving a good decision theory for imprecise credences, which is already a big challenge that philosophers uh, are like focused on. Mm. And so that could be something that philosophers and economists, you know, you know um, could uh, contribute to and, and finding a way to demonstrate that like there is a rational kind of like precise credence to have in cases like this mm. is also something that like, I think both philosophers and economists and others can like, can definitely like contribute to. What's an imprecise credence? Oh, an imprecise credence is where you don't, you know, so with credences, the idea is often that we have very precise probabilities that we assign to like different states of the world. And, you know, we, this seems like an idealization. It seems like I don't actually have like a real valued, you know, like I have 0 0.7149231 dot, 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 dot um, in like every, in some given state of the world. So an imprecise credence is that the value of your credence is in fact an interval, you know, between zero and one. And so maybe I think that instead of saying that I have a credence of like precisely 0.6, that this thing is going to occur, maybe I actually have a credence that's between like 0.5 and 0.7, or maybe my credence is in fact the interval 0 0.5, 0 0.7. And so it, it just is uh, cases where we don't have precise credences, but rather we just have intervals. Okay, so you was, it sounded like you were saying that if we adopt imprecise credences, then uh, we have a challenge at the decision theory end. Like, yeah, how do these credences then interface with our decision procedure? Yeah. But uh, why would these imprecise credences really help? I guess so. It helps with the problem of it seeming arbitrary to give kind of a point estimate of your of the likelihood of kind of every possible outcome. That could yeah, to say that they're equally. Yeah. So the question is like, what? So the first question is like, what is the rational attitude to have towards? these like potential long-term ramifications that are like very positive or very negative and that are kind of unforeseen at the moment. And if you answer that question with, you don't have enough, like given your kind of lack of evidence, but the fact that you, but the fact that there might be a kind of consistent effect in one direction than in another, you should have like an interval valued credence over these uh, outcomes, you know, where at the very extreme end of interval valued credences, you can have like an interval that's just the entire zero one interval. Or you might think, no, there is a precise credence that you should have about these outcomes given your current evidence. Um, there's just a way of like partitioning the world um, such that you're like, yep, I have like that specific hypothesis that I maybe even haven't consciously formulated in my brain about, you know, having these positive effects on the economic situation, which leads to this person being elected, which leads to this person adopting this healthcare policy in the country, etc. You know, give that really precise state of the world, I should have a very precise credence that that state of the world will be like uh, the thing that is the outcome of my action. And so the idea is like, you first ask what's rational in this case, and then you have to ask like, how does this affect our decision making? And if it's precise, you know, I think that uh, the answer is hopefully just going to be that uh, it's going to massively increase like the value of gaining information about these kinds of effects. Uh, if it's imprecise, then we need a decision theory that can like deal with uh, imprecise credences. Okay. Is it possible for this cluelessness issue to kind of have a funny interaction with moral uncertainty or like other moral theories that we might put some credence on? So you can imagine if, if there are moral theories saying that like it, it's very bad if if your actions have any possibility of creating like a negative outcome, like violating yeah. someone's rights, then you know, if you're only thinking about the direct effects of your actions, then it seems kind of easy to avoid you know murdering someone yeah. or, or causing someone to be murdered. But then if you think about this like spiraling uncertainty and kind of all, all the chaos that your actions create and how they change the entire course of history, yeah. it seems like any action that you take has some possibility of causing some horrific outcome in, yeah. in the future. Uh, and so they might kind of all be forbidden. Yeah. Although, yeah, one result is that, you know, you could think that this ends up in kind of dilemmas. So like a theory that says um, you should basically never risk violating someone's rights far into the future. And then I can say, actually, every action available to me has a risk above some like threshold of like doing this. You know, then if your theory just says if the probability is above some threshold and it is in this case, then you just shouldn't undertake the action. That theory would presumably end up with just dilemmas given like closeness worries. 
which I guess on pragmatic grounds is a reason to prefer like more linear theories than ones with like strict prohibitions where, where something is like, you know, infinitely bad or very bad or just totally impermissible. Yes. Yeah. I think that's seems... like twice as likely as twice as bad. Yeah. And I, yeah. I think that most theories would uh, have that as part of them. Mm-hmm. So like take, yeah. So take a theory like a kind of moderate deontological theory. It's not clear to me that they would actually have the same kind of problem with cluelessness that say consequentialists have because they might just say that the thing that matters is like the causal effects of like your actions and not necessarily things that like uh, later in the causal chain that although would not have happened had you not done the thing are not in fact like things that you are responsible for because like another agent has touched them now yeah there's like an intervening yeah there's an agent that's like well like it's not the case that um if foreseeably uh this action will lead to jane being born and uh, then Jane goes on to like commit a robbery that I was somehow culpable for the action of Jane's robbery because Indeed, like all of her ancestors are culpable. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so like theories that like deny that, as presumably like a lot of theories are going to just might have less of a problem with closeness. They might still have some problem, but they might not think that things like future rights violations are the responsibility of like current agents. They might say yes, it is actually quite you know, we do want to work out this uh, problem because we also do care about the causal impact of our actions, as like a lot of uh, non-consequentialists do. We just don't think that the key thing is going to be something like rights violations that occur in the future. Do you want to see more people working on this general research question? I think that I would classify a lot of questions in this area as like, again, this feels to me again, like a, a kind of important, but not necessarily urgent question. So it depends on what people would be doing otherwise, I suppose. I mean, I suppose another way of looking at this has just been people who have been trying to research what are the flow through effects or the, you know, the long term effects of our actions. And, you know, often they end up working on some kind of like existential risk or, you know, long term future yep. projects. And they've in some cases found, you know, uh, things that they can work on now that they think have satisfactorily, like confidently positive effects in the long run. But that might just be like a more practical way of approaching the question. Yeah, although, so there is this question of like, you know, and I'm not going to give a great answer to that. It's how useful is like very theoretical research in areas that can have like very real world impacts. And I think, you know, maybe I could kind of step back my earlier answer because I'm like, maybe if you find a really good response to this problem, it can lead to kind of further insights that are actually like themselves very useful. So things like how to quantify how valuable information about the long-term effects of our actions is, um, is kind of difficult without an answer to this, like slightly more abstract seeming problem. And so one response someone might have is something like, oh, well, just do the practical work, like just, you know, try and work out flow through effects and do all of that um, kind of stuff. Uh, And I'm like, yes, that is really important. But actually, maybe if you could just like generate a fairly like neat uh, solution to the abstract problem, it would just give this really good grounding to all of the other kind of practical work that occurred in this area. And that could, in fact, be kind of helpful. So, yeah, I think that sometimes this like kind of theoretical research can really create like very good foundations for like later practical research. So given that these long term effects of our actions might be very large and also very uncertain, does that imply that this should be one of the main things that we're researching? Because just the value of further information about them is, is so huge. Yeah, so I've thought before that one thing that uh, is kind of unfortunate is that value of information is often just kind of a side consideration when it comes to thinking about how much, how we can do good in the world. If we think that the long-term effects of our actions are like very large, it could be that finding out more about the expected long-term consequences of what we do is actually like an, an extremely valuable part of a given, of like investing in an intervention. And so if you think that the value of information um, is very high in the ethical domain, this can like favor a couple of things. One is that it can favor kind of doing more research. So just like trying to investigate how the world is actually going to be and like what the impact of a given uh, policy has been in the past um, and all of this kind of stuff. But I think another thing that it means is that investing in interventions could itself be valuable mainly because we then get information about the impacts of those interventions. And so we can kind of run experiments, basically, and we can try out things and see if they work. And I've talked a little bit about moral value of information in the past, and I think that the main thing that I kind of concluded from it was that it's very easy to take 
this kind of like evidence-based mindset when it comes to doing the most good. We were like, let's just take these interventions for which I have like the most evidence about what the nature of their impact is. And let's just like invest in those. Or you can take a kind of more expectations based kind of approach where you say, well, actually what we should do is we should run some experiments and we should try out various things and see if they work because we just don't have a huge amount of information in this domain. Um, And if you take that kind of attitude, you could end up kind of investing in things a bit more experimentally. And I think that there's potentially a better case to be made for that than people have appreciated. And so that might be one consequence of this is just, hey, the ethical value of information is actually like higher than we thought. And maybe we should just be trying to find new ways of like gaining a bunch of information about how we can do good. So this is a somewhat generalized argument in favor of doing things that are uh, have very uncertain outcomes, as long as you can learn from them in some generalizable way. Yeah, the, I, th- I think an interesting kind of consequence of this that is perhaps somewhat counterintuitive is that if you have two interventions and one of them is like very well evidenced, we know like really precisely like how much uh, good it does. And we have another intervention that has a kind of plausible mechanism because it can't you know be terrible in expectation. So it's a plausible mechanism for doing a bunch of good, but it has like a huge range that it could, you know, it could do virtually nothing or it could actually be really fantastic. You know, so an example of the first thing might be like, you know, anti-malarial nets, for example. So insecticide treated bed nets are are just like, you know, there's a lot of like randomized control trials about how effective they are. But you could have another intervention on malaria that's like much more experimental. And we just, you know, we, we just don't know how effective it's going to be. That you could actually think that it's likely to be like, in expectation, it's actually like less effective than the first one in terms of its direct impact. And yet overall, you should invest in the second one because you'll get information about where it lies on the kind of like the scale of value. And that will mean you can either reinvest in it or just never invest in it again. Um, And so, yeah, it's like, actually, maybe you should prefer interventions with like less evidential support over those with more evidential support. Yeah. So, so that makes sense as long as you're getting like a good, a good measurement of of what the impact is. So this is kind of an argument in favor of, you know, we should do a lot of science and and science and technology and should spend a lot of money on R and D because it will have like like really beneficial long-term consequences. Yeah. But I guess, I guess in the case of cluelessness anyway, it seems like we might just learn basically nothing. We do a whole lot of work and then we still don't know, like we're, we're yeah, just as clueless at the end of the these, process. Like, yeah, you still just haven't touched these like long term. Um, because the problems are so fundamental and the future is so chaotic. Yeah, you're just like, I actually just think that I can't really predict what the outcome, the very long term outcomes will be. So I think this is like a good argument for like why if you can get information, especially about like very long term impacts of your actions, then that information is like especially valuable. But I don't think this is like a solution to like the problem of cluelessness, because I think that even if you could get information of that form, you would probably still have this problem because you'd be like just given like chaos, you know, these long term unforeseen consequences of my actions could still occur. Okay, so so we're kind of stuck with with cluelessness. I mean, how do you feel that the kind of practical solution that a lot of people have gone on board with is, which is of just trying to reduce the probability of civilization collapsing, uh, in the hope that that is a good signpost to a good future? Like, is that at all satisfactory in your mind? I find this like kind of a satisfactory answer to a lot of things, just because I'm like, these problems are difficult, but you know, if you generate this like space where you can like reflect on them and work on them that's almost always like a good thing so i am sympathetic to that uh, kind of approach to like most very fundamental ethical problems it seems very plausible me- to me that you should like try and secure uh, the lives of like people living now and people living uh, in the near future because you can't solve these problems if you don't have people who can like work on them and so yeah i'm like sympathetic to this being the approach that people take Okay, that's that's somewhat reassuring. Yeah. <laughs> so, so just coming back to the value of information issue, mm-hmm. you, you gave a talk about that at EA Global last year, right? Yeah. So it sounds like one of the, one of the conclusions is that you should like spend spend more resources than you otherwise would doing things that are in a sense not very evidence backed, where you're, where you're unsure what the outcome is going to be, so long as you can measure it and learn from it. Yeah. Are there any other kind of key conclusions that people should take away from this value of information consideration? I think just thinking about the different ways in which you can gain information. So I think often when people think about information, they really do just think about the research component. And I think it's important to know that a really good way of getting information is just by doing the thing and then getting the data yourself. Sometimes like the the data just doesn't exist. Uh, I think this like generalizes. I mean, we haven't talked about uh, careers 
so much, but I think this is actually really important in one's career as well, is that if you have an opportunity to simply try things, this can be a really good way of getting information about how, how good it is. And people can get kind of paralyzed by the the evidence and think that the thing to do is like analyze existing evidence. And I think that, you know, one of the other conclusions that I came to with this is like, think about investment as something that's mining value of information and not just direct value. So I think that was like a main one. And I guess this is also an argument for the community as a whole, kind of sending one person into lots of different areas so that they can learn about whether it's promising and uh, bring that information back to the group. Yeah, I think it's important. You know, I'm not saying this always overwhelms things. Like maybe there are just like really important things for people to be doing and really important career tracks that are like fairly narrow because, you know, immediate needs or something outweigh this consideration. But like all else being equal, I think it's like, quite good for people to be like trying lots of different things um, and seeing what the impact of them is if there's like a plausible mechanism for it being fairly high impact. So obviously there has to be a plausible mechanism. You might just think that there are certain paths that people could go down. They're just not likely to be super high impact. Clearly we shouldn't send someone into everything. It's it's only the things that seem like promising enough and where you could learn a lot by putting someone in. Yeah, that seems right to me. Is there anyone who has kind of a good uh, process for going through and estimating the value of information from from different actions? Or is this still kind of an unsolved practical problem? There's a lot of research in how you should evaluate the value of information. Uh, There's a lot of results that should make us like a little bit pessimistic about this. So the thing I'd recommend that people read on, it's just very interesting, is stuff on um, multi-armed bandits Mm -hmm. and the multi-armed bandit problem. And one interesting uh, and kind of relevant puzzle for practical real world stuff is puzzles where the probabilities of uh, success for each thing that you're trying uh, change. You know, so it's like, imagine you're playing uh, a couple of multi-armed bandits, but the probability that they'll, like the expected payout actually changes over time. This is like an extremely difficult problem. Like, uh, and it's extremely difficult to know like where you should explore and where you should exploit when you have problems of this form. And I think a lot of the real world problems have that have that form where like the, the amount of value you get from like working in a given domain might change drastically depending on ways that things in the world are going. And so I can't offer a huge amount of practical advice here, but I do think it would be quite possible for someone to do like very applied work in this area, like actually trying to assess like how we should assign information value to like uh, working on a working on a given problem, say. I'm planning to interview the authors of a book called Algorithms to Live By, which yeah. has a chapter about these multi-arm yeah, bandits. Yeah. It's also a really great book. I recommend it. Yeah, it is very good. Unfortunately, I think they could, they finished that chapter talking about how this this is like a very difficult, yeah. somewhat unsolved problem yeah. in computer science of what you do when when the payoffs are changing over time. Yeah. Um, maybe we'll see if in the meantime they've, uh, they've managed to come up with any better answers. <laughs> We've just solved a potentially unsolvable problem. Okay, let's push on to a new topic. One kind of theme that I've noticed to uh, some of the things you've written online is uh, kind of what seems to me like an attempt to kind of synthesize um, the views or arguments that are often associated with social justice activism with kind of a more rational or like Mm -hmm. analytical uh, philosophical style. Yeah. Is that something that you're consciously trying to do? I think it's partly just that I often agree like with many of like the arguments or uh, conclusions of like uh, people who are like advocating for like greater kind of like social justice um and i see like a lot of you know common themes between that and people who are like effective altruists this idea of like expanding your kind of moral circle beyond people who are just like like you and in your kind of local area but rather to like lots of different people in society and looking back at the kind of history and the effects that that those people have like underwent and like you know trying to basically improve the lives of as many people as possible and i think that in some ways this can get kind of Uh, There are really good arguments for like many of the positions that like I think social justice advocates are like putting forward. Um, And so I always like just want to kind of make those arguments because I think sometimes they can be kind of caricatured or like bad forms of them can end up, you know, being like uh, released on the Internet. And suddenly everyone thinks that that's, you know, I don't want it to be the case that people start to think, oh, the only defense of like these kind of social justice movements are these arguments that I disagree with. I'm like, no, they're actually really good arguments there. And so we should search for those and like, like look at the merits of the best arguments and not merely like dismiss things because we don't like the way that it's put, say. So it's a bit surprising that there's uh, so many kind of conclusions that you kind of agree with that are often being justified on bad grounds. But like, wh- how, how is it that the conclusions are good if, if you think that the, the typical arguments being made are are not good. Is this like an example of kind of moral convergence where different theories or 
when thought through properly, kind of reach the same ideas? I think it's more that, you know, I think that there are actually good arguments, you know, so it's hard to talk about it, like, without specifics. But, you know, something that I am really interested in is, like, some issues in things like criminal justice reform. And I think that the arguments in favour of that uh, that are, like, quite effective are ones that, like, look at the history of, say, crim- the criminal justice system in the US, who it currently affects, you know, the fact that it, like, affects minorities really strongly, even when there's like kind of parity of crimes being committed. And so those arguments are out there. And I think that what people sometimes do is they like, they don't like, or maybe they disagree with a conclusion or they just see a bad form of the argument made somewhere and don't think, well, actually maybe there's like a really good case to be made for this. Or maybe there's a really good case for us to be a bit like humble about what we think in these areas, because, you know, we've just come out of like really quite terrible periods in history. And we should maybe think that our society isn't set up in this really great way for everyone. Seems pretty plausible to me. And instead, they're just kind of like seeing an argument that they don't like made by someone, you know, on Twitter or something. And they're taking that to be representative of like all of the work that's gone into this, when actually I think that the work that's gone into this from like historians and philosophers and like various other people is like often like way better than the thing that you're reading on Twitter. So it's kind of like, you know, remember that like, there's actually like really good, you know, I think there really is like quite robust stuff here and that we shouldn't just like kind of dismiss things because we don't like the way that one person puts it. Um, so I like, I feel very strongly like about that, I guess. So to make it more concrete and, and I guess possibly uh, more, more provocative to some group, but I'm not sure which one yet, uh, are there any kind of specific, uh, you know, debates around social justice activism that uh, you think uh, deserve, a, deserve a steel man to f- philosophical defense that, that haven't, haven't been defended as well as you'd like? So I think maybe I want to focus on a kind of reframing of some issues that I hope that people can agree on. So sometimes I think that it's really unfortunate that policies that could potentially be good um, and that we're really just trying out, uh, for example, uh, like positive discrimination. Hmm. Like positive discrimination is like quite controversial, I think. Hmm. I see that more as a kind of social experiment. Um, something that we we should try out for a long time and see if it works um, and see if it like makes people's lives better. And if it does, then that's great. And if it doesn't, then we performed an experiment and we found out that this wasn't the way to actually like improve people's lives. And so sometimes I think that you can defend a lot of policies and you can find convergence on policies if you explain to people that this is an area where it's important for us to just try various things and to like get the information on whether they work. And sometimes I think people are doing the thing that we talked about earlier, where they're looking for like, you know, it's like, I must have just established that this intervention works really well before I try it. Whereas my attitude is like, hey, here's a defense of these policies. Like we should just try them for a fairly long time and see if like the long-term ramifications of them are good because that's like, that's what we're trying to improve. Isn't just like the life of this like one person right now, but rather to try and like make society kind of more equitable and like function better for everyone. So there are like, yeah, I think that's like a steel man of specific policies that are controversial. Yeah, I have lots of like very pro kind of social justice views that I think are like very steel manable, I guess. Mm. So I guess with with experimentation, the usual approach is to experiment on a smaller scale and then like increase the scale as yep. um, the evidence base gets better. Mm-hmm. Um, why, why do you think we should um, experiment with uh, with affirmative action on a broad scale uh, first or, or, for, or for such a long time? Yeah, so I'm not sure about the broad scale versus, na- you know, you want to, with a bunch of interventions, you probably want to experiment with them. You know, there are ethical issues with experimentation if you think that it's likely that, that, that this policy will succeed because then you're like harming the people in the areas where you're not performing the experiment. I'm more in favor of like just trying to gather more information, but I kind of understand that there, that people might have worries about that kind of thing. I think that long term, the structures that we have in society now took a long time to build up. And the idea that our goal should just be to kind of in the short term, just like adjust, change the lives of people and that everything will be fine seems implausible to me. Um, rather, I think that it's that we want to kind of slowly make adjustments to society that will make everyone better off and that that will involve doing things that are like better in the long term. I am not certain that we should just be doing like broad scale uh, things rather than like experimenting and seeing what works. You know, that could be really good. Maybe you have one u- university that tries you know, like one thing uh, to like make their classes more inclusive. And then you have another university that tries another thing. And then you get more information about which of those things was better. That seems like quite good to me. But I also do think it's good to take this like long term attitude towards these things and be like, we want to change society, you know, incrementally, you know, in the kind of like long run and not just like in the immediate, like next two years or something like that. Hmm. So 
It seems to me like there's often kind of a tension between people who like a really analytical, philosophical mm-hmm. style of, of reasoning um, and social justice activists. Mm-hmm. Do, do you think this is indicative of like really fundamental disagreements or is it more a matter of um, how they speak and yeah, and how they like to communicate and perhaps things being lost in translation? I mean, I tend to th- think that it's more the latter, but I also have, you know, I've been in this and I know other people who are similar where I have never been in... You know, I didn't go to college in the US, for example, and a lot of people talk about this specific like US college experience that I just didn't have. So all of my like exposure to things like feminism and social justice came really via like academics and people who you know, were making extremely reasonable and sound arguments that I like agreed with. You know, obviously there's like lots of reasonable disagreement on all of these issues. Um, but I never encountered something that I thought of as anything that was inconsistent with like just analytical kind of careful arguing styles, or at least for the most part, I didn't. Um, and so, yeah, I think insofar as there's like tension being created in the kind of like public discourse, I suspect that it's not over like, it's not because like one side has like logic and reason on its side. I think there's just like a cluster of really reasonable disagreements here. And it could also just be that people are just dividing into like political tribes. And that's like, I think a very damaging thing that can happen. And that could also just be like the source of it here. Yeah. How, how impactful do you think it would be for someone to try to do, I guess, a rationalist synthesis of uh, social justice uh, ideas or try to carve out kind of conclusions that are appealing to one side using like, uh, you know, a reasoning that's appealing to, to, yeah. to the other side or like to help people to understand one another? I guess yeah. it seems like that would be uh, quite a personally challenging thing to do because you'd, you'd be attacked by all kinds of people yeah. whenever you touch these issues. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I think it's, you know, I don't know how unfair it is to academic work in this area because I have looked into this a little bit and you have like readers on you know some of these uh, issues so like you know there are like historians or like his- people who look at like the history of of like uh, U.S. policy like you know like historians of like U.S. housing policy for example can give you like a lot of information about why you see like very like uh, entrenched uh, divisions in like housing in the U.S. like now And that work is like good and accessible. I do think that there could be, you know, maybe it would be good to have more work that is like engaging directly with the public on some of this stuff. And I think we're seeing more of that. I've definitely seen a couple of books come out recently, which were like targeted at like a general audience. And we're just trying to like slowly go through all of the arguments in favor of like, you know, say uh, there was a a recent book uh, on like misogyny and uh, I read through some of it and it was like, yeah, this is just like reasoned arguments about like the nature of misogyny that is aimed at a general audience. And I think like does a decent job of like communicating these ideas in a way that like, you know, not everyone is going to be sympathetic to, but at least it's not, you know, obscure. It's like, you know, it's very standard kind of analytical style, I guess. Uh, So when I mentioned on Facebook that I was going to be interviewing you, uh, someone asked the question whether you think utilitarianism is compatible with social justice causes. Mm-hmm. Or, uh, and how and to what degree do you think they're actually intention? Yeah, so I think that like one thing that happens a lot with people who think that utilitarianism is correct is that you can end up having to prioritize causes based on how much harm you think that they're causing. And so this can mean that you have a kind of ranking of things in terms of badness, like the things that you want to work on. You know, so it took me a long, you know, I when I was younger, I became like vegan and I was very interested in like animal ethics. You know, I think one of the first books I read in ethics was like Peter Singer's Animal Liberation. And then when I like heard about effective altruism, I was really convinced by these arguments that like global poverty was very important. And that's actually like where I've put most of my money, for example. And then, you know, slowly I was like kind of reluctantly (laughs) convinced that like these issues, like um, reducing existential risks were actually like really important And I think that's like a good process to go through. Like if there's a sense in which if you reach these unusual conclusions about what's most important non-reluctantly, I kind of trust them less. I came to that conclusion kicking and screaming and trying to find every argument against it. But it can make it look like you think that the other stuff is less important. So if you come to the conclusion, oh, I should be working on like reducing existential risk. So I don't work on global poverty and I don't work on issues that affect animals. 
but you somehow think that those things are like not important. And I think the same can be true of like social justice causes. And I think it's important to emphasize that that's like not the case. You know, I think criminal justice reform in the US is like an incredibly important uh, topic and not one that people should be tackling. I think issues of like improving the lives of women is like incredibly, both like within the US and around the world is like incredibly important and one that people should be tackling. And so I don't think that there is a tension fundamentally, because I think that often people working on social justice issues, like have the kind of the the core thing that effective altruists or utilitarians kind of agree with, namely, they're trying to expand their moral circle, and they're trying to like benefit the lives of people. And the tension comes at the level of like what they prioritize. And I think this is both in terms of uh, the causes that they end up investing in, um, and also things like whether you want like uh, whether you think that like systematic versus incremental change is important. So I see those as being two of the kind of tensions. I think utilitarians are often more inclined to favor incremental change rather than like sweeping change if they think that it's like implausible that we can actually get sweeping change. Whereas a lot of people are more like I think a lot of social justice movement work is like focused on not solely on systematic change, but like more so on systematic change. And so I think like it's sort of unfortunate because like I would rather have this attitude of there's a cluster of things that are super important. I want people working on those things. And just because I'm like having to do this weird ranking and then working on things that I think are most important, it doesn't in any way like diminish the ethical work that other people are doing. I guess imagining that there's kind of uh, two groups, like social justice activists mm-hmm. and uh, people who are skeptical of social justice, justice activism. Yeah. What would be your kind of biggest criticism of, of each group? How would you like to see them change and improve? So I suspect that I would like more of a kind of prioritization attitude in social justice activism. And it's not to say it's like not there, but prioritization is not a kind of common tool that's wielded in like most places, I guess. And so... It would be nice to see, and also like maybe a broadening of the of the scope of issues that people work on, and that's sort of happening. Like I think you're seeing people care a lot about like immigration issues, for example, more than in the past. And I hope that we'll also see this with like caring about like global poverty issues as a kind of like social justice concern. And so I think like a mix of like really trying to target like the things that will have the most impact would be like really good, and also like yeah, broadening the issues that people consider, which is happening, and I think it's like going to be a good thing. I suspect based on like more based on my interaction with other people than or like testimony from other people than any personal interaction I've had that the thing that people mainly find off putting um, about social justice activists is like the methods of engagement of like some of them. And maybe some people feel kind of attacked when they just don't understand these issues or they want to get to know them and they feel like they make mistakes and then they get kind of eviscerated and are like, well, I, like, I just don't know anything about this issue. And so like, you know, and I don't feel like I'm being engaged with fairly. And if that's the case, it's like probably not a good way to like uh, have a dialogue with people. It's good to be like, look, some people just won't understand this stuff or have encountered it. And it's important to be like kind and considerate while they're like learning about it. And if we aren't, that's just like bad for discourse. Uh, and I think from the kind of more like, you know, people who are anti-social justice activism, I think it's a mix of like what I would want to see more of is a combination of like epistemic humility and probably like historical research. So in some ways for me, a large influence was simply looking at like the history, like how recent the history of like a lot of this stuff is, you know, like until we we just had like an incredibly unequal society and we've had like laws enforced in like really like unacceptably unequal ways uh, up until, you know, like school segregation was happening until like way more recently than I thought. And like when I looked into school segregation in the US and I was like, there were there were schools that were fighting this like really not very, lo- like not that long ago. And so I think that like having a kind of more historically informed attitude towards uh, like why we should kind of expect society to be kind of unequal would be good. Um, and taking that historical um, information and using it to, to be like, I'm going to be a bit humble about this issue. So I'm not going to assume by default that like everything is equal. Um, And instead, I'm going to assume like that is just very likely that people are kind of doing worse than they otherwise would if we like just had like a kind of uh, fair society. Um, So, yeah, historical research and like a little bit of epistemic humility is probably the other good thing. So how do you think uh, the quality of discourse between these groups could uh, be improved uh, the most so that they can uh, you know, actually gain some kind of mutual understanding and perhaps even be able to work together on solving solving some problems that they that they both accept? 
Yeah, so I think that one phenomenon that I've seen happening sometimes in these debates is that people will they'll have a controversial view that they'll want to kind of put forward or at least have in the you know eyes of their reader kind of supported, but they won't want to take ownership over the controversial view. And so they'll assert something that seems to kind of strongly implicate the controversial view. You know, so an example of this might be saying something like, oh, most of the wage gap uh, between men and women can be explained by like women's choices. And so someone might like, you know, post something about, say, a study uh, that just talks about like the fact that like uh, women take more time off work to do childcare, uh, explains the difference in income. And this can seem to imply that like there is no problem, basically, you know, so there's no kind of bias against women in the workplace, nor is there any need for kind of systematic change of the way that we like, you know, do childcare or like, you know, the nature of like taking time off or, you know, uh, maternity leave or anything. And they might not want to assert there is no problem and there is no bias against women in the workplace and there's no need for change. But that's like often kind of implicated if you don't cancel it. You know, if you don't say, I'm not saying uh, that like this explains everything or that there's no need for change, but we should know that like some of this is explained by this other phenomenon. And so if you express your values and you show that you really care about women and that this is just a, a way of like finding out the best way to like improve the lives of women, I think a lot of people are actually really sympathetic to that kind of claim. You know, so if I were to say, oh, it turns out that like this is the thing that's causing women to earn less. So we should be focusing on that thing and how to improve it and like what we can do here. That's just a very different thing than just asserting the fact with the full awareness that what people are going to pick up on is the standard kind of cluster of views that people who assert those facts have. And so I think that this is like quite damaging because you want to just engage with people at the level of their actual views and to be able to like criticize those views and doing this kind of like thing where you uh, implicate a controversial view without asserting it. And then if someone says, I don't believe in the controversial view, you saying, I never said that. I just said this fact. It just means that people can't actually engage at the right level with one another. And so I guess when I see that kind of thing happening, it makes me sad because it just doesn't lead to kind of good discourse. And so I think that a, one thing that I, you know, it's maybe a kind of obscure thing that I want to see happen a bit more is people kind of taking ownership over the things that are implicated by what they say and either cancelling it by saying, I don't actually think that thing, or just embracing it and saying the thing that I think is this more controversial thing. And I think it's supported by this piece of evidence that I just gave you um, because it just feels like a more honest discourse then. I know what someone's view is. And I like to think I try to do that. Like I try to, I try to strongly express my values before I state something. And if I'm aware that the, the thing that I could say could like have negative co- or like could be interpreted in a way that is not consistent with my values, then I like try and eliminate that interpretation or I like try and clarify it later. You know, if I say something and people are like, oh, it sounds like you're saying that this terrible thing, then I'll be like, oh, I totally didn't mean that. I see how you thought, thought I was saying that. That seems like it seems like an important part of good discourse to me. It seems like a, an important part of like honest discourse. And so I would want to see people not doing kind of yeah, this like discourse via implication or something. Uh, Yeah, I guess this is consistent or like one way of uh, shortening that advice is kind of the more controversial, the more more it's you're talking about a hot button issue, the more you have to be extremely careful to be clear about exactly what you are saying and what you are not saying. Yeah, I think that's right. I, and I guess also show like concern uh, for the other side and, and and their interests. Even people who disagree about it, you might uh, share more more values or more goals than, than might be immediately apparent. Yeah, yeah. And strongly share your values, you know, so like in some ways, like the thing that I don't like is when I think someone's values are bad. You know, so if I think that someone genuinely cares about like everyone and the, like all of the people that I care about, about and they just think that there's like a different way of helping them like our disagreement is like in many ways like much less strong right you know like that's a kind of that's a productive disagreement to have Mm. you know where they're like look i i really want like these people to flourish but this policy just isn't helping them right now so you know i want the poor to flourish but this taxation policy is actually harming them and so i don't agree with this taxation policy that's like a much better discourse to have than than having a discourse with someone where you're like i'm not even sure you care about these people Mm. and so like i think both being being very clear about your views, but also being really clear about your values, like can be very helpful here. That that reminds me of this uh, blog post you wrote a while mm-hmm. back, which I really loved about vegetarianism and abortion, and yes. I guess and I guess trying to get uh, kind of good moral discourse between uh, groups with with actually different values. I guess in this yeah. case, um, do, you, do you want to explain the argument that you were making there? Yeah, so the argument was basically that we often seem to betray a kind of complete lack of what I call moral empathy where moral empathy is trying to get inside the mindset of someone who expresses views that we disagree with and see that from their point of view, what they're talking about is a moral issue and not merely like a preference. 
you know, so the example, the first example is like vegetarianism, where you'll sometimes see people basically uh, get very annoyed, say, with like their vegetarian family member because the, the person doesn't want to eat meat at a family gathering or something like that. And it's like, you know, the, I think the example I give is this makes sense if you just think of vegetarianism like a preference. You know, it's just like, oh, they're being awkward. They just have this like random preference that they want me to try and like accommodate. Uh, it's much like less acceptable if you think of it as a moral view. It's like you wouldn't, and you know, you see this where people I think are a bit more respectful of like religious views, you know, so if someone like eats halal, I think that it would be seen as unacceptable to like, uh, you know, people wouldn't have the same attitude of like, oh, how annoying and how, you know, uh, terrible of them. But I also think that this is, you know, so I wanted to use a couple of examples in this post of this phenomenon. And the one on the other side is like uh, the issue of abortion, where a lot of people who are anti-abortion, the criticisms of them are things like people will respond to anti-abortion arguments by saying things like, well, if you don't like abortions, don't just don't have one. Mm. And then you're like, but this doesn't make any sense because like, if I take this person at their word and they genuinely believe that abortion is murder, it doesn't make sense to say, if you're against murder, just don't murder people. Like that's not an argument that, um, that anyone would find convincing. We're like, no, we think this is like morally wrong. And so we should all be against it. And I think that like when you engage with people at the level of their actual moral views, you can actually find ways of like having a productive dialogue. You might think that they are being disingenuous and that is something that you should definitely like, you know, you should assign some probability to that like sometimes people will say, oh, they, you know, like this person says that they're anti-abortion and they're actually just like misogynistic or something. But it's like absolutely that's like a possibility, but it also is just possible that they genuinely just believe that abortion is murder and then you have to try and engage with them at that level and actually engage with that belief and I think that when you when you do that you can just like have a slightly more productive dialogue where you're not treating this you know I think it must be frustrating for someone with that genuine belief to have people treat them like they're being disingenuous or that you know they just have some preference against abortion and it's probably like much more productive to just assume like kind of good faith on the part of your uh, the person you disagree with. I think it's probably more productive. Yeah, well, I mean, it's highly likely to be more persuasive. Yeah, because you can engage with them at the level of the arguments that they actually agree with. Mm. You know, or, so, or at least the arguments that they're giving. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And like... Um, do, you, do you think yeah. people are, are too quick to produce these alternative explanations for why people who disagree with them are doing what they're doing? I mean, sometimes I think that it can look, you know, and maybe I'm just being, maybe I'm inclined to be overly charitable towards people because I'm kind of like, if I can find the best version of this mm-hmm. person's argument and I can show that that's wrong, then I'm safe. You know, like that, that's it. Like, you know, we've done the, you know, we've just changed their mind ideally. Sometimes I think it's that people see kind of inconsistencies and their best explanation is some kind of disingenuousness. So in the case of like abortion, an example is that a lot of people who are anti-abortion are also anti-contraception, even if the contraception doesn't result in uh, fertilization. And that can seem a bit strange because it's like, well, even if you're against abortion and contraception, you surely think that abortion is much worse than contraception. And so surely you, here's a point of agreement. We can all just agree to like have much more contraception available. Like, why can't we just move forward with that being roughly the policy? I think... A more charitable explanation of this is that the people who are anti-abortion and anti-contraception are kind of thinking about what in their minds is the best possible world. And the best possible world is one for them where like people don't use contraception and people don't get abortions. You know, and there are positions in ethics that, that say that that's like the relevant world is the best possible world. And if that's correct, that kind of charitable interpretation where it's like they're not malicious you can again like engage with that because I think that belief is false. I don't think that the best possible world is the one that's relevant. And so like maybe by breaking down that belief, you can actually like find a convergence on a kind of point of agreement. And so I think sometimes people are just seeing inconsistencies and things that they don't, you know, in, in the position of their opponents and they're kind of treating it as evidence of bad faith. And it's like, look, sometimes people can in good faith argue for like things that are ethically wrong. And it's fine to just engage with them on the assumption that they're arguing in good faith. Well, one thing is that, I mean, they could be mistaken for a complicated reason that they haven't realized. Another thing would be uh, it, when you're debating with people who come from a very different school of philosophy, perhaps yep. like a more a more theological or religious one, yep. uh, then there, there may just be all kinds of arguments uh, on that terrain that you are not familiar with, that yep. you don't understand. And so for you to say, well, I looked at these things and I couldn't find a way of making them consistent might, might just be a measure of your ignorance uh, rather than a measure of the inconsistency of their view. Yeah. And you should obviously, you know, like as with all things, it's almost certainly the case that sometimes 
it's just that there is no good argument. Someone's just saying something on the internet, you know. But I tend to think that a good procedure is to try and like as much as possible find the best version of these arguments. Um, and yeah, be aware that like some people are just operating with like, yeah, different assumptions and different pieces of evidence than you. And that you're just in a much better position to convince people if you can demonstrate. You know, I, I find people in conversation much more happy and just much more willing to discuss with you if you show that you actually have cared enough to go away and research their worldview. Mm. And you might be like, look, I looked into your worldview and I, I don't agree with it, but I've, I'll demonstrate to you that I understand it. It just makes for a much more friendly discussion, basically, because it shows that you're not like, I don't even need to look at the things mm. that you've been raised with or, or understood or researched. Uh, I just know better without even looking at them. And I'm going to tell you that you don't believe what you believe for the reasons that you say. Exactly, like, yeah. It just sets up this like, really, <laughs> really bad dynamic for like debate, I think. Yeah, so like in terms of like things that would improve discourse, I think this is like, yeah, assuming generally that people are operating in good faith. And trying to then reconstruct their view, given that assumption, can just be like really helpful, I think, in like a lot of uh, moral debates. Mm. Yeah, there's been a few cases in the media recently of people expressing very controversial uh, moral views and, mm -hmm. and very distinctively like moral views, which I, I disagreed with actually all of them. Yeah. But I uh, really didn't like them getting shut down because I felt like if they were right, then it's extremely important that they be able to voice these views because yeah. it would mean that we were making a huge moral mistake. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's you know areas where I have kind of controversial views where I think society's making big moral errors. Yeah. And you know people might shout me down, and I feel well, I'm happy to let other people kind of express their controversial moral views uh, for the sake of us all learning from one another and potentially correcting these errors and yeah. as much as we're wrong. In part because they might be right, but also because I want to have a social norm that allows me to express kind of my, my controversial views as well without yeah. being shut down. And it is like when these are moral issues, this might be like the most important kind of things going on. And like, in as much as we can identify yeah. you know, a moral catastrophe that people aren't recognizing, yeah. uh, it would be so important that it might be worth accepting some degree of discomfort or some mm -hmm. degree of controversy in order to ensure there's a process that will allow us to bring those uh, to light. Yeah, I think... I'm inclined to agree. I think most people uh, actually like to some extent agree on this issue where it's like there's this important norm of kind of like soft freedom of speech, you know, so not the stuff that's like guaranteed by government, but rather that we allow people to like express controversial views without like having kind of disproportionate responses to them in a way that just disincentivizes them from talking. And, you know, one thing that I think is really unfortunate about the internet generally, or maybe like, I think that there's this really difficult transition that people have to make from the non-internet era to the internet era. Um, and one example of this is that people don't often think about proportionate feedback. Mm -hmm. So sometimes, you know, I've expressed this before where, where I say like, I will often look at what someone said and I might think the thing that you said was wrong and I disagree with it. And then I look at the amount of like feedback they've had from people already. And often if they've expressed it publicly on the internet, they've had like this huge amount of negative feedback. They basically had people swarming them, telling them that they hate them. And I'm like, that actually like you, like insofar as you deserve to be like punished for say, say they express something that was actually immoral. It's like, I don't want to just add to that because it can really kind of have this damaging effect where people are so scared of saying anything that people might disagree with because they know that they're going to get this disproportionate response. And so I then just choose not to add to it, even though I disagree with them. And even though I agree with the people who are saying this, this view is false. And I think that there's not a lot of norms that we currently have, which tell people like that indicate that we should do that and that we should be kind of proportionate in our response to people. And that's like unfortunate. A further thought that I have on that is just that a thing that I'm inclined to criticize often more than just the content of someone's view is like how they express it. Mm -hmm. Because one thing is that if you do express a controversial view and you do it without care and you do it without, you know, you do the thing that I was talking about earlier, where you, you do it via implicature and in this indirect way, you create this huge amount of work for the person who wants to disagree with you. So I've had views where I want to disagree with them, but I'm aware that like in order to disagree with their 300 word statement, I'd have to give like a 2000 word response that's like, look, here's precisely what you're what you're saying because you weren't clear. Here's precisely what your statements implicate because that wasn't clear. And here's why all those things are false. And so there is this this thing where I'm like, also, people need to take responsibility for the way that they say things. And that's what I'm often inclined to criticize much more than even the content of of the views. Yeah. 
I like that, but I have this kind of half-formed uh, thought that I've been um, having recently, which is like, so I think for the sake of being able to like figure out what's true, yeah. uh, we should have a lot of forbearance mm-hmm. towards people who express things that we don't like. Yeah. Uh, that like, even if it makes us angry, we should like try to stay calm. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I realize that this also implies that when someone says it, this is kind of this outrage cycle, right? So someone says something outrageous mm-hmm. and then someone gets outraged at them and then people get outraged at the outrage and then there's outrage at the outrage at the outrage and it just goes on. Yeah. I realize that I should also have a lot of forbearance potentially for the people who were hurt by the original claim, yeah. who, uh, you know, were made very angry and perhaps, you know, uh, shouted at them or like said, said things that someone else finds offensive. Yeah. And that, you know, it's, it's understandable, you know, if someone says something that's like particularly hurt, that might be hurtful to an individual because it affects them directly mm-hmm. uh, and, and they get angry. Like I should also have forbearance towards that and like not try to get too angry in response. Yep. I think if more people, I guess, <laughs> tried to adopt this view, then maybe like at every cycle of, or at every point in the outrage cycle, you could potentially be tamping things down a little bit. Yeah. But at the same time, I, I suppose people might respond that you need to have outrage to the outrage to preserve the freedom at the first level of discussion. I don't know. It, it gets very complicated. Yeah. So there's this, I mean, I often think that you know, I wish we could probably, and maybe it already exists, but like, you know, norms here that are like friendly and, you know, so like when I say things like people should take responsibility for the way that they express things, I also think we should have like a lot of tolerance for people who fail to do that Hmm. and give them an opportunity to clarify. So one thing I would never do is just be like, your statement implicated this thing, this thing is morally repugnant, you're morally morally repugnant and no one should ever listen to anything you say. I would just say, hey, this thing, that the reason why people are disagreeing with you so strongly is because the thing that you said implicated this thing. And then you can clarify it and you can like remove that implication. And so I think we find it very difficult to know where to draw the line between sort of friendliness and outrage. And the danger that you talked about is a kind of real one where sometimes we can find it hard to see whether a view that is like controversial or kind of out there is in fact just kind of on the on the edge of like current ethics and we're not even seeing it. You know, so like if, if historically, you know, arguments that like, hey, maybe animals actually like matter and we shouldn't just like harm them arbitrarily might have looked like really absurd. Similarly, for arguments that you should favor people regardless of whether they're from your own country or not, like would have looked anti-patriotic and like possibly like would have been perceived as really controversial and bad. Seditious. Yeah. And, and so because we know that in the past, some views that we now think are correct um, were extremely controversial and would have been kind of shouted down, we should have a kind of attitude of like risk where we're like, understand that any view that someone puts forward that is of that form, you know, it could be of that form. And so we do want to protect some ability for people to talk controversially. And then is there a line at which you simply refuse to engage with someone? And I think there is. It's just that what we're trying to determine is where that line is. And some Mm -hmm. people are, are seeing views that they disagree with and they're kind of like shouting them down. And it's like, well, maybe even if we feel like that's appropriate, we should kind of step back the line and like allow for more room for some views of this form or for people to clarify their views or whatever and reserve like extreme outrage for kind of genuinely and obviously like outrageous views. Yeah. Yeah. Although I'm in favor of forbearance, it's like, it's, ab- it's certainly not absolute. Yeah. Uh, like you do see people who kind of um, stoke controversy or say things that are, are predictably will make people feel threatened or insulted. Yeah. And they're not kind of even driving at potentially some really important moral truth. Then mm-hmm. the thing may not even really be re- relevant to any decisions that we could make. Yeah. And they don't seem to be kind of in good faith saying like trying to, reduce the uh, amount of the, 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 the threateningness of what they're saying as much yeah. as possible, which is what they'll do if they were really just concerned with kind of the, the, the truth of the matter and, and like the offense that they were causing was just an unintended and unavoidable consequence. Yeah. So in those cases, maybe we shouldn't uh, just like stoke the outrage cycle, but it should, it should be strongly discouraged doing that kind of thing. Yeah, there's a set. Yeah. And I think this is like the thing about responsibility over the way that you say things, because it can feel like disingenuous if it seems like you're just trying to create kind of intellectual clickbait. Um, And it's like, you could have views that are kind of a little bit out there, but, you know, whenever I have views of that form, I like to think that I try and put them carefully, you know, and I try and explain precisely why, you know, and and bring people, you know, you you reached this point where you thought that this controversial thing was true. And ideally you reached it with like values that were good and from an earlier starting point. And I'm like, if you genuinely think that that controversial thing is true, you can give these like reasoned arguments from the starting point that you started at to that conclusion. And I mean, that's what I think a lot of the good work, you know, if you look at the kind of controversial views that turned out to be kind of, we now think are correct, like, hey, you should actually care about people in other countries and you should like care about animals and you should expand your moral circle far beyond like just your kin. 
a lot of the work that went into that wasn't like intellectual clickbait. It wasn't like, haha, I found this like fun thing and it's super controversial, but I'm going to claim it's true. It was like careful reasoned arguments that people were giving. And so I think that that's more powerful and that like we should probably really praise that. And as a result, like, yeah, we should focus more on like, I think it's fine to just be like the way that you did this was wrong. Even if your conclusion turns out to be correct via these reasoned arguments, the fact that you didn't give them is actually like in and of itself something that we should be like giving you negative feedback about. Mm. So that's a, a, a nice seg to uh, the next section of uh, three questions that I mm-hmm. ask a, a, a lot of guests. Uh, and then the first one is, um, what's your most unusual view, kind of philosophical or otherwise, and, and perhaps especially relative to uh, potentially the listeners to the show? I think my most unusual view is very hard for me to say because uh, I do have some unusual views. You know, I've argued for things like I don't think that there's like an obvious distinction between like uh, things like prison and just corporal punishment. And so I find it a bit strange that people are so fine with prison and uh, not okay with corporal punishment. Yeah, flesh this one out. Uh, I imagine a lot of people won't have heard this argument. Yeah, so the idea is just um, think about, you know, there are various like m- things that um, – punishment is intended to do. And so one of the, you know, one of them and the, you know, the argument for prison is sort of, it's intended to like keep people uh, isolated from society where they can't do harm. But there are all these other functions that punishment is supposed to serve. So it's supposed to like, I mean, merely punishing the person for having done some, done something wrong, for example. It's kind of retribution. Retribution and, and also preventing other people from uh, doing the wrong in future. So creating these disincentives. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people, if you just care about keeping people away from society, then it doesn't seem obvious that you should have any kind of like, that prisons should in any way be bad places. But a lot of people seem okay with the idea that you can group together like all of the kind of punitive aspects of punishment and put them uh, into like the prison system. And like, that is what prison is. Uh, You know, it's like this very punitive uh, thing where I think a lot of people, so the, the thought experiment I sometimes give is like, you can have like three years in a US prison, or you can lose like your pinky finger. Um, which would you prefer? I would prefer to lose my pinky finger. And you can do this like trade off with people where you're like, how much corporal punishment would you be willing to like take on in order to like avoid being in a US prison for like n many years? And we can use that to measure roughly how punitive it is to be sent to prison. And then a lot of people seem to think that it's really that the idea of corporal punishment is like really terrible, but that somehow prison is okay, even though it's like this punitive uh, like the the imprisonment is like has this extremely detrimental effect on the lives of the people who go to prison, and I don't quite see why how you can like maintain that view. And so you can go in many directions with this. The direction I tend to go in is like uh, we should think that like the punitive aspects of prison. If we think that corporal punishment is bad, and I think we should, then we should have this equal attitude towards the the like way that we run prison systems, so that they're like extremely harmful for the people who go there. And so like I I come at this from this kind of consistency thing of I just can't maintain a difference there. If, if I would prefer to lose my pinky finger than go to prison, then why hasn't society harmed me more by sending me to prison for three years than it would have if it just cut off my finger? Mm. I mentioned that some people might attack you for this saying, how can you say that corporal punishment could possibly be acceptable? To which I guess you might say, how can you say that prison can possibly be acceptable? Yeah, this isn't, to my mind, this isn't an argument for the acceptability of corporal punishment. It's really to emphasize that we are not taking into account how bad prison is for people. Mm. And maybe you think it's fine and maybe you think it like the punishment is justified, but it's like when you see a news story and it's like someone has gone to prison for like 10 years think about what you would be willing to undergo in the way of like physical harm to yourself in order to avoid that punishment. And remember that what is happening to them is like as bad as that. And so you shouldn't have a, this. So my thought is I kind of want to take the viscerally negative reaction that people have to corporal punishment and attribute that to like a prison sentence and be like, if you think that like, it would be really terrible to like lose your left hand, but you'd be willing to lose your left hand to avoid eight years in prison. Then when you hear that someone received an eight year prison sentence, that same feeling um, of like kind of horror should apply to, to that sentence. And obviously that isn't always going to mean that you don't think that the sentence is just. It's just to say, like, let's make sure that we're being proportional in our kind of understanding of this punishment and not pretend that it's like uh, this kind of light or that is nothing and that we're just hearing these numbers. And, you know, I think this is more true of like, like more minor crimes, for example, and you might hear a sentence that's extremely high for like a fairly minor offense. And 
ideally this would like get our kind of moral emotions more in tune with like what's actually happening mm. um, to the person in question. I recall you wrote some article about this uh, years ago. So uh, we can try to dig that up. And, and yeah, I think I, I have that. a blog post on it. So yeah, um, I think th this topic is also discussed in a book called When Brute Force Fails mm -hmm. uh, by an academic who studies criminal justice reform. Uh, I think uh, Mark Kleiman. Yep. So I'll stick up a link to, to that book no, if that you're interested great. in learning more. Yeah. Okay, so uh, second uh, common question. What do you think effective altruism is doing wrong? And I guess it doesn't have to be, you know, uh, the, the worst thing that's happening, but something that you think is underappreciated that, that you've noticed. Yeah, so I think, you know, I say don't give like too much confidence to what I say on this issue because I would need to reflect more on it to give like better views. My immediate response is like there are kind of two conceptions of effective altruism. There's a kind of thin one and a thick one. And on the thin conception, it's just that you want to do the most good and you want to use evidence to do the most good. And I'm like, it's for me, it's kind of hard to object to that. Like people might disagree about like what in fact does the most good. Um, and so some people who think that um, more systematic changes is, is feasible, they're not disagreeing necessarily with effective altruism. They're just disagreeing with like what is effective. But this thicker notion is more like the way that the community is like beliefs in the community and the way that the community operates uh, I suspect I would like to see more, more kind of inclusion of people with like different backgrounds and views. You know, I think effective altruism has like attracted a kind of certain type of person. And I hope that kind of broadens out because I think that would like really increase the sort of general level of expertise that like the community can appeal to. Um, and it would also potentially increase its like broader appeal. I also think that being a bit more careful about how things are presented uh, would be good because you can alienate potential allies you know, I've talked a bit about the fact that I think that a lot of very altruistically motivated people might look at effective altruism and think that they don't care about social issues, for example. And you can actually just correct that by like making clear that you do think that these issues are really important. It's just that you think that there are other areas that are really neglected and that's why you're working on them. So you can cancel some of that stuff that is going to alienate people like, oh, you just, you know, you only care about this cause area and you think everything else is rubbish. Yeah. And related to the issue of like, kind of appealing to like a broader group of people or at least like bridging gaps. Uh, I think that it's easy for this kind of like in-group talk to start occurring within effective altruism. And it's a really natural thing to have. People want to start using technical language, but it's, I think one has to be aware that you're trying to talk to like many people. Like effective altruism is, is not just trying to appeal to like say one set of academics who already have like technical language. It's trying to appeal to like both members of the public and members of various different disciplines. And I think that in order to do that effectively, you really have to keep your communication like as accessible as possible. And that means avoiding like terms that are just like not common English terms, for example, without fully explaining them. Um, and so I think that, yeah, like trying to be more inclusive in, in the way that things are described could also be like quite good for effective altruism. Yeah, I'm uh, also pretty worried about jargon. Uh, it's like not that unusual for me to hear conversations between people involved in the community that I can't follow because mm -hmm. they're just using all of these uh, obscure terms. One thing that particularly bothers me is uh, coming up with new terms that don't have any natural meaning uh, where there's already kind of a word, like a short phrase that could be used to describe them, yeah. which I see happening reasonably often. And just uh, it seems almost deliberately uh, exclusionary <laughs> yeah. to come up with these. Yeah, and, 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 and really unnecessary. Yeah, and I think I understand the instinct, you know, like, I do like the fact that, you know, in philosophy, it's really common to like, if you think that an English language term just doesn't quite describe the thing that you mean, to just make up a term and then like attach a meaning to it. And the idea is just to avoid ambiguity. But really, that's only okay within certain like discourses. And really, it's only okay if you actually define the term, like very commonly, even if people are doing this in talks, they'll actually give the explicit definition. And so when people just start using these terms in a kind of offhand way, the cost to that is like exclusion. And it really has to be worth the cost. You, know, you have to be like, there is no other way of describing this term. So I'm going to take on the burden of like every time I use this term, explaining to people what I mean by it, because it's so useful. And that's true of some things. You know, there's certainly some concepts that are just like that, but they're not that common. And so, yeah, I feel quite negatively about discourse that I can't just enter and understand and I don't think it's like a mark of a good writer for, or a good communicator that like it takes a huge amount of effort to understand them. In fact, I often think that we should have norms where if you don't understand people relatively quickly, you're not required to continue to engage with it because for many reasons, but like uh, it is the job of communicators to like clearly tell you what they mean. And if they fail at that, like it's not your job to like 
you yeah. know. They can't impose like such large demands on other people. Yeah. And actually I think it can be damaging. So people can do this in ways that are not just about jargon, but about ambiguity. And so if you have, if you communicate in a way that's ambiguous or that uses a lot of jargon, what you do is you force people to spend a lot of time thinking about what you might mean and suppose that they generate like 40 interpretations of what you mean. You know, if they're a kind of smart and conscientious reader, they're going to be charitable and they're going to like attribute the best interpretation to you. And I think this is actually really bad because it can mean that like ambiguous communication can actually be really attractive to people who are like excited about like generating interpretations of text. And so you can end up like having these really perverse incentives to to not be clear in a way that's just going to alienate a bunch of people and make some people like really attracted to like uh, the message that you're putting across. And so there's like a lot of things operating here that I'm like super wary of. And I think that there are norms in philosophy that are not always followed, but it's one thing that I always kind of liked about the discipline is you were told to always just basically state the thing that you mean, to state it as clearly as possible. And I think that's like a norm that like I live by. And I also think that people appreciate when reading. Yeah, this is getting close to kind of a hobby horse of mine. Uh, Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm quite an extremist, I think, on this communication issue. So mm-hmm. when I notice people who I think are being uh, vague or uh, obscurantist, that they're not communicating as clearly as they could, yeah. kind of my baseline assumption is that they're pulling a scam. I mm-hmm. think they're pulling the scam where they're expecting other people to do the work for them and they're trying to cover up weaknesses in what they're saying yep. by not being clear. Yeah. Um, maybe that's like too cynical. Maybe that's too harsh an interpretation. I guess, you know, we're saying we should be charitable to other people, but, but, but honestly, my experience very often just has been that like, even after looking into it more, that has been my conclusion that people who can't express, or especially people who can't express things clearly, but claim that they have some extremely clear idea of what they're trying to say. Uh, I feel that, that they're just pulling a con. Yeah. And there is this, you know, something that happens is things can be very difficult to read or understand because it involves a lot of prior knowledge or assumes a lot of prior knowledge. And so if you come to something without that knowledge, it can be really hard to interpret what the person is saying. And so this can be in some ways through very little fault of the person who is communicating. It's just like, this is a really technical area of engineering. And if you're in no way an engineer and you've never read any papers in this field, you might not understand this paper, but it will refer you back to things. It will continuously refer you back until you can basically give yourself the education that you need to understand it. But if you're coming from the outside, it can be hard to differentiate between someone who's just so far ahead of you that you just don't understand what they're writing and someone who is just kind of being obscure. And it's like, even if you understood everything um, relevant to this area, you would still think that this person is being obscure. Um, and I, I think that like taking advantage of the difficulty of differentiating those things is really bad. Mm. And in a lot of ways, I think I'm pretty good at telling the difference between the two things. You know, so like some of the papers, you know, I, I have to do like a lot of literature reviews for like my thesis. And some of the papers there are like quite technical and I think shorter than they need to be. Mm. You know, I, I read them and I'm like, I wish you had made this three pages longer and just explained everything because that would have really helped the reader a lot. But I know that you weren't. I know that the thing that you were saying was true and you referred me back to lots of things. You you know, you gave me the citations, you, you made reference to the theorems that I needed to know to be able to understand this and so on. And so like you gave me the tools and you weren't being obscure. It was just difficult to, to read you without that background. And like, I think, yeah, I, I'm really, as a result, I both think that actually we should kind of criticize it in academic work and be inclined to make our work much more accessible to people, not just within our field, but in other fields, and that we should be extra inclined to criticize it with people who are writing to a general audience because there's just no need to do it then. I think one pattern I noticed that makes me especially annoyed is uh, when they then criticize the people who can't understand or look down on them. Yeah. Uh, And that's a real red flag for me, that something odd socially is going on here. Yeah. Um, Maybe one reason why I'm particularly skeptical here is that I just rarely find that I encounter this problem myself, that even in quite complicated areas, I usually find that I can at least get people to grasp kind of what I'm pointing towards, even if I can't explain all the technical details. There's usually some core that people can conceptualize. Uh, Yeah, I think that's right. And And sometimes it can be hard to communicate it in one medium and easier in another. You know, so like I find a lot of the work that I do easier to communicate if I have like diagrams, for example, and so harder to communicate verbally, easier to communicate on paper. But yeah, I think I've like almost never met a topic where I'm like, I could in no way describe this to someone so that they have a basic understanding of it. And I think I would see it as a failing on my part if I couldn't. I wouldn't assume that this was just some, there there are just these mysterious areas that are too obscure to ever bring someone up to speed on. I would just assume that like I 
you know, often when I am in that position, I think I don't fully understand the issue. And so like, yeah, I'm, I'm quite inclined to be like, it's really our job to like make things clear to people and people appreciate it and then understand it. And also it's completely acceptable for people to ask what things mean and to ask really simple questions. And there's this like, maybe this is like a too much of an aside, but there's this interesting phenomenon that I think does happen, which is like when people become sort of secure that people aren't going to look down on them, they start asking really simple questions again. So a question I often ask, like when someone says, you know, say they give me like, uh, they, they talk about an issue and there's a word that they use and I just don't understand it or I don't understand how they're using it. I'll ask what they mean. And I feel completely comfortable doing that. And I think it's because I'm pretty comfortable that they're not going to think I'm like stupid or that like, or they're not going to like sneer at me and be like, how can you not know that word? They know that it's like important for me to understand the word. And I'm, and I just like feel comfortable asking the question. And this is kind of pernicious because like, I think the people who don't feel comfortable are, are the people who feel like kind of scared that people are going to look down on them. And that means that people who would find it really useful to have clarification feel like they don't even have the tools for finding that clarification. And so I think that like worries me, especially because it's like this practice doesn't alienate people who are sufficiently confident that they're willing to ask, but it really alienates people who are like a little bit unconfident or worried that they don't know an area. And those are exactly the people that would benefit from like clarification of like what the person is meaning. Um, and so it's this like negative thing where, yeah, like you certainly shouldn't like look down on people because it like it, it creates that like really bad spiral um, and it really alienates people in a way that like makes me it makes me quite annoyed, uh, yeah. I guess. Yeah, I've noticed this uh, technique of using uh, vague and confusing language to trick people into thinking that you're really smart works better with people who are intellectually insecure for this reason oh, okay. because they don't feel they don't feel okay to challenge you and they feel like they have to pretend to understand and they can't like they can't probe about each point like what did you mean by this? What do you mean by that? Yep. Yeah, and it's like it's 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 really frustrating to see happen. Uh, it's like no, just call bullshit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> They're not saying anything real. Um, yeah. But yeah, this is this is kind of a huge topic that maybe maybe we deserve no, its own episode yeah. or its own section. You know, I think it's you should really resist this. You know, I resist it a lot in maybe this is controversial, but in things like the history of philosophy, you know, we have to study his, like historical figures. I feel like often the historical figures that we study can be the ones that are like more obscure. Because the ones that were super clear don't really require much interpretation. But this can also mean that there's this incentive to come up with these like theories about what the person meant that are just like consistent with the thing that they said. But the thing that they said was like sufficiently vague that there are lots of really great consistent interpretations. And then um, say that that's actually like what they meant. Um, and I'm just like, we can just avoid all of this by like really like just like reacting negatively and like not engaging with discourse that's like insufficiently uh, clear and just being like, I read it a few times. I think that what you're saying is like too vague. And so like, you know, it's your job to like clarify, but at the moment it's not really doing anything for me. All right. That was a big, big diversion. So yep. the, the third question that I ask a lot of people is uh, what is the best argument against effective altruism or perhaps what you're working on or what um, the community as a whole is working on? Oh, that's an interesting question. So again, I want to kind of distinguish the thick and thin notion of effective altruism. I find it hard to think about arguments against the idea that you should be altruistic and that if you're going to be altruistic you should try and like be quite effective i think arguments against you know and i've already mentioned some problems like with the community that you know could be kind of arguments against uh, some practices within the community i think that in terms of like what people are working on and what i'm working on a lot of uh, what we're moving towards presupposes to some extent, things like the importance of like the far future. So this is like something that people are getting really concerned with in effective altruism, and I think quite fairly. But it does rely on sort of views within population ethics that are like not uncontroversial. Um, and so I think that one thing that would be kind of nice to see, and I think we will see like a lot more of this, is like just much more public defense of the sort of like population ethics assumptions like underlying uh, a lot of the the reason to focus on like on issues that are uh, long run rather than uh, affecting people that uh, are alive today. Uh, so I'd like to see more of that. I think I think it's important and like, yeah, it would be great to see more of it. OK, so we, we've talked about a couple of uh, blog posts that you've uh, written. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think that blogging is, has helped your career or is it something that uh, the philosophers kind of look down upon? I'm not sure about philosophers. I think it's often kind of funny that like I rarely put out work that is like, you know, my, my academic works here on my thesis, there's like a good chance that more people will have read like 
a given blog post of mine than will like ever read like anything that's in my thesis. And so there's like one potential negative effect of doing things like blogging is that it now means that the things that represent me are like pieces that I wrote in like 25 minutes or 50 minutes or a few hours um, and not the things that I spent like four years working on. And that also those things are like much harder to communicate, I guess. I think in general, it's good. I wouldn't mind doing more of it because it kind of forces you to like, it's a different style of writing. I don't get to like assume a bunch of previous knowledge and it forces you to be like really clear about your ideas. So I think that like publishing generally is like fairly good blog posts. Yeah, it's like you have to, I think people have to be a bit more tolerant that you're probably going to say like false things and make mistakes. But in general, it's like quite good for people to just be able to like refer to things. The, the negative aspect of blog posts is that there are a lot of benefits that come with completing a piece, you know, so there's like a lot of, I think there's actually like a lot of benefit to like the kind of detailed work that you go into when you write an academic paper and it just doesn't come out in a blog post and because you never need to do it. And so you could find that there's some really great objection to something that you're stating and you're just not going to find it if you're just spending a few hours like writing up an idea that you had. And so like, yeah, it's kind of like not the only thing that we should be doing, but I don't think it's like in and of itself kind of negative. Let's talk for a while now about your, your thesis topic, mm -hmm. um, which you've been working on for so many years, which is, uh, broadly speaking, I guess, infinite ethics and the problems that that presents and how we might solve them. Yep. So what is kind of the fundamental issue raised by infinite ethics? So there's several problems raised by infinite ethics. So infinite ethics is just ethics where the future contains infinitely many agents who can have like positive or negative levels of well-being. And most plausibly, it affects ethics when the causal ramifications of your actions are infinite. So the future light cone is infinite. A lot of ethical theories care about the well-being levels of different agents, even if that's not all that they care about. So utilitarianism is a theory that cares only about how your actions affect the well-being of agents in the future. But you also have things like uh, non-absolutist deontological theories, which might care about things like rights violations, but they also care about how many agents are affected by your actions now. So I might not be allowed to say break a promise, but if it's the case that, you know, in order to save 100 lives, I have to break a promise, maybe it's acceptable then. And so in cases where there are like only finitely many agents affected by your actions, there are a lot of principles that we can just endorse without problems. So an example of like two principles that are really important in ethics. One kind of class of principles are sometimes called sensitivity principles. And these are principles that say, if I can make at least, you know, say one agent better and I don't make any agents worse off, then I've like made the world better. So you're sensitive to like local improvements. And another class of principles that people think are important are these principles, which we might call like equity principles. And so these basically say that if the only difference that I make is who is affected, um, but not say the total level, like each, uh, how, how happy everyone is, then my theory shouldn't care about that. So if I have three agents, um, one of them's like at utility three, one of them's at utility two, one of them's at utility one, then I should perhaps be somewhat indifferent as to like which of the agents have those utility levels. And the thought is that's a kind of fairness principle um, because I'm, I'm not biased in favor of like one specific agent. And in finite cases, those principles are generally consistent with one another. In infinite cases, they can often be somewhat in tension, um, or at least people have started to identify tensions between these principles. So the reason for this is one kind of way to formulate equity principles is to say something like, well, if the distribution of well-being is the same at world one and at world two, then world one is as good as world two. But then I can give a case. So I think this is from Hampkins and Montero. So imagine that you have agents whose names uh, are just their utility levels and you just have all of the integers. So there are infinitely many agents, you know, zero, one, two, three, four, five, et cetera. And also minus one, minus two, minus three, minus four, et cetera. And then I take each of these agents and I improve their utility by one. And now I still have the same infinite series of integers. So I have, you know, zero, one, two, three, four, and minus one, minus two, minus three, minus four, et cetera. And so by the sensitivity principle, I've made the world better. But if we think that our equity principle is one that says that these two worlds are equally good because the distribution of kind of utility levels at the worlds is the same, then we end up with a kind of contradiction. 
So this is just like one example of like the kinds of problems that you get in infinite ethics that don't arise in finite ethics. And it's most of the problems are of that class. Uh, they're of the class of we have these principles that in finite ethics are perfectly consistent. And then as soon as you move to the infinite world, we actually realize that these principles were, are no longer consistent. Okay, so uh, these problems arise when you have an infinite number of agents, potentially, or yep. a finite number of agents, and like some of them would have infinite levels of welfare? Yeah, you can. So infinite worlds are usually worlds where, uh, you know, there's like there's potentially infinite positive utility, say, and infinite negative utility. I focus on worlds that contain infinitely many agents with finite utility levels. You can also generate these same problems by having, say, one agent with infinite positive utility. I think the set of problems that you generate in that case are going to be slightly different. And so it's important to, to say what you're focusing on. Sure. Okay. So how likely should we think it is that we live in a universe where there, where there could be infinite welfare? Yeah. So there are a lot of hypotheses that seem to give us reason to at least... Uh, not be certain that this is not the case. So some theories in physics seem to predict infinite universes. So like eternal inflation theory um, is kind of a notable theory on which the areas of the universe that are like conducive to life uh, can be like infinite in extent and could contain infinitely many uh, agents with the potential to have positive and negative levels of well-being. Uh, you also get like much more unusual theories. Uh, so the kind of theories that you need to just generate a non-zero credence can be quite weird. You know, you could have like, you know, simulation hypotheses and all of this kind of stuff. And that would be enough to, to make you at least not be certain that it's not the case. Um, but actually, I think that there are like much better arguments for saying like, we should take this very seriously because at least uh, in some theories that some kind of empirically testable theories, this could certainly be the case. Uh, say, similarly, like if the curvature of the universe is like is zero uh, and there's some indication that, that might be the case, then you could expect a universe that's like infinite in extent. Hmm. Okay. So there's some physical reasons to think that the universe might continue forever or be like infinite in space. Yeah. And I guess there's also people who think it's kind of a multiverse or like all kind of possible things exist and, and like other theories that would say that there's like an infinite number of beings. Yeah. Although we do have to discriminate, I think, between theories that say that there are, are infinitely many agents and theories that say that you can causally affect the uh, well-being levels of infinitely many agents. It's not to say that these problems wouldn't arise, uh, even if it were merely the case that there were like these kind of isolated universes that we couldn't affect, but that contain infinitely many agents. But I do think that one can then start to appeal to like the causal ramifications of, of your actions to try and solve that. Hmm. But importantly, there are like some theories in which like the causal ramifications are themselves uh, non-finite. And so we can't get around it like simply by doing that, I think. And you were saying we're not sure that this is false. And I guess that's because if you think that there's any probability that you might affect an infinite number of agents, then kind of a lot of these problems kind of go through, even if you're not sure about it, right? Yeah. So what you want to try to do is figure out first what happens uh, just if you assume that this is correct. Um, so let's just assume that the universe is infinite and has all of these properties. And then what you want to try and do is step back and say, well, what if I'm just uncertain about whether this is the case or not? And so one of the things I try to do in my thesis is to at least indicate that there are puzzles, there are analogous puzzles that arise um, for agents who are merely uncertain over these infinite outcomes. And there's also something a little bit concerning if you can show that some of these hypotheses that you have like non-zero credences in generate these kind of like very bad problems in ethics. Yeah. So I always heard about infinite ethics as this, this problem that uh, let's, let's say it's possible that there's an infinite amount of uh, utility in the world or that the future will have an infinite amount of utility. Then because if you add a finite number to, to infinity, it's still infinity. And yep. if you multiply uh, infinity by any finite number, it's still infinity. Yep. Then it seems like you shouldn't be able to, you, you can't have any effect on the like future total utility in the world. Yep. And so every, yeah, every action uh, seems like equally as good. Uh, yep. And potentially also it seems just undefined because you could have both like infinite positive and infinite negative. Yeah. And so there's just like nothing you can really say about the relative goodness of uh, the consequence of your actions. Yeah. And so I think we can avoid the first problem. So this problem of like, I just add, you know, some amount to this infinite positive utility and I don't get any difference. So that is kind of based on the idea that we should be measuring the goodness of outcomes by something like the cardinality of the utility. Mm -hmm. You know, so... 
where cardinality is just like what can be put in one to one correspondence. And because like if I take an infinity and I, you know, I boost two agents by two, it's still the case that I have the same kind of total cardinality of utility or whatever. Hmm. I don't think that that's how we should like think about utility in infinite worlds. So I'm more sympathetic to the idea that you should care about improvements. And you can simply say that if I make any agents better off, then relative to the world in which they're not made better off, I have in fact uh, made a difference. So imagine I have infinitely many agents at utility one, and then I, I boost two of them up to utility two. You know, you might think I haven't made a difference, but I have if I if I adopt these sensitivity principles like Pareto. You know, so Pareto says if I make any agents uh, you know, I make some agents better off and I make no agents worse off, then I've made the world better. That principle is going to say that that world is better and um, the one where I've like improved the lives of two agents. The key problem is that, you know, from my point of view, once we bring that principle in, we can generate this inconsistency with uh, these like really plausible equity principles. So yeah, like we solve one problem and we generate yeah. a bunch of other problems, basically. Okay, so you want to say that the classic kind of infinitarian paralysis, this thing where every the consequences of all actions look equally good and maybe undefined, yeah, it, that that isn't a major problem in your mind. I think that's not a major problem if you accept something like the Pareto principle or kind of extensions of the Pareto principle. So, so why should why should we accept the Pareto principle rather than just kind of summing summing it all and then saying, well, it's infinite no matter what? I think. The question then is like, what are our kind of fundamental ethical commitments? So to my mind, the idea that like improving the lives of some agents and not making any agents worse off results in a better world is a pretty fundamental ethical principle. Hmm. Whereas the principle that says something like sum the total well-being and then just look at what the sum says, hmm. um, especially in infinite cases where like this isn't always very well, this isn't well defined. I mean, then you're what, identifying the sum with just like infinity. Uh to me, the, the more fundamental principle is this sensitivity one and not this one that says something like... And it's, it's, when you really ref reflect on it, it's quite a strange principle to say sum the total utility. And if it's infinite, just label it infinity and then say that anything that gets that label is like equal to anything else that gets that label. Hmm. And that seems like really implausible to me, whereas Pareto seems like a very plausible ethical principle. So yeah, I would happily kind of ditch the ditch that sum principle in exchange for keeping the Pareto principle. Do other philosophers in this area, I guess all two or three of them, <laughs> do, do, do they agree with you? Like, should, should this be regarded as a, kind of a problem that we, that we should stop worrying about so much? Because I, I guess there's, I imagine there's like potentially hundreds of listeners who are aware of this infinitarian paralysis issue and might be somewhat troubled by it. And you're saying, no, like, don't worry about this. There's other issues that, <laughs> that yeah, we need to worry about. Yeah. So I think that my impression is that the key problems that people have focused on in this literature often do involve like a commitment to the Pareto principle first and foremost. Mm. So there are multiple literatures where this stuff is kind of happening. And so some of it's happening in philosophy and some of it's happening in the kind of intergenerational equity literature in economics. And there's like discussion that goes back and forth there. But most of the discussion in that literature uh, does kind of presuppose Pareto mm. and doesn't presuppose something like you're just looking at the sum total and if the sum total is positive infinity then just treat all of those things as equal mm. and you know th that principle is just inconsistent with really plausible like really plausible notions of what makes a world better mm. you know so imagine infinitely many agents at plus one utility whatever that means on our on our scale and then take half of those agents and just bring them down to zero and it's like, well, the total's still infinite and positive. Should I really say that I've like not made uh, the world worse by making infinitely many agents worse off? Mm. I mean, that seems like a bad result. So I think if your theory says I can make infinitely many agents worse off and without making any difference to how good the world is, that doesn't feel like a kind of a good kind of ethical theory to me. Mm. So instead of getting rid of this uh, desire to kind of sum all the utilities, uh, are there any different ways of treating infinity or conceptualizing infinity that would get around this problem? So I think that the issue is not with how we are like conceptualizing infinity. There are decision rules that can be used to try and discriminate between different worlds that contain infinite utility. So one important problem in infinite ethics is what you're summing over. So in finite worlds, it doesn't matter whether you sum over times or over agents. So I can take you know a room full of people, suppose that there are two people in the room, and they're going to be in the room for two hours. And each, at each hour, I look at uh, how much well-being there is in the room at a given hour. And in the first hour, there's four. 
total. And in the second hour, there's six total. And so I say, okay, this two person, two hours was 10, 10 total units of well-being. Or I could look at how much well-being each agent has over the course of the two hours. So it turns out that the first agent has five over the course of the two hours and the second agent also has five over the course of the two hours. And I'll get the same result. In infinite worlds, it matters whether you're summing over times or over agents. So I can take, I mean, I could give an example, um, sort of a known example that generates this problem. So this is like the very famous thought experiment in infinite ethics, which says, uh, imagine I have a world and there are kind of infinitely many agents distributed in space time and all of them are really happy. And I drop a sphere of suffering into this world and it expands at a finite rate. Once you're within the sphere of suffering, you will never leave it and you'll be unhappy uh, thereafter. And these agents live for an infinite amount of time. So this means that in this world, every agent starts off happy um, for a finite period of time and then they end up unhappy for an infinite period of time because they're within this terrible sphere of suffering that's expanding. And then it could take a different world where same setup, but all of the agents start off deeply unhappy and I drop a sphere of happiness into the world and it expands at a finite rate. And once you're within the sphere, you're happy. And so each agent in this world is like unhappy for a finite period of time and then happy uh, for an infinite period of time. Now, if you were to just like look uh, at any given time in the first world, you would see, you know, so just imagine we just take a time slice kind of, and we look and there's just infinitely many happy agents and there's this finite sphere of suffering agents. So any given time, this world has finitely many unhappy people and infinitely many happy people. And so if you just looked at times, you might say, actually, this first world with the sphere of suffering is better. Mm. Then take the second world and at any given time, you're going to see finitely many happy people and infinitely many unhappy people. And so you're going to say the sphere of happiness world is, is worse. But if you look at each agent's lives in the sphere of suffering world, they have infinitely bad lives. And in the sphere of happiness world, they have infinitely good lives. And so if you were to sum across lives, you would say that the sphere of happiness is a better world. And so you get this conflicting um, assessment in infinite cases. And this actually is a problem for how you are going to like add up utility, if that's what you kind of want to do in infinite worlds. Because times have this, you know, basically space time has this nice thing, which is it kind of comes with structure. And so I can I can look at one region and then there's a there's a natural second region. You know, so I can look at the first hour and then I can look at the second hour. Agents don't come with this kind of structure. I can move agents around in space time um, and they don't come with a kind of natural ordering. So if you have a natural ordering of agents, you can start to use all of the standard tools that we use to kind of compare, you know, these infinite sequences. I should say that the sphere of suffering and sphere of happiness case is a case by Kane. It's like a good paper and uh, I recommend people read it. But you can take these uh, infinite streams of times and you can do things like uh, look at the difference, you know, from stream one and stream two. And then see whether, you know, so if the difference, for example, the limit of the difference is positive, then you can just say that one world is better than the other. You can start to use principles like this, which people have proposed in the kind of intergenerational equity literature and elsewhere. If you're summing over agents, if agents lack natural structure, you can kind of see why those principles aren't going to help you very much. Because now you have to just say things like under all possible orderings of sequences. Mm-hmm. So under all, all, all possible orderings of agents, this first stream is better than the second, then the first stream is better than the second. But that's such a weak principle because it will virtually never be the case that under all orderings, the difference is, is not going to diverge. So that's why I don't think that the problem is necessarily with our conception of, of infinity, but arises because if we believe that the things that we're summing over lack kind of a natural ordering, then a lot of the tools that we have to use to compare them really don't work as well. Okay, I just want to take a quick diversion from mm-hmm. this to uh, get you to answer people who might be listening to this and are saying, like, we've lost the plot uh, worrying mm-hmm. about infinite worlds. And uh, they say, like, this has just become absurdly philosophical. Yep. How can this have anything to do with, you know, doing the most good? Yep. Uh, wh- what do you say to that, to that criticism? So I have sympathy for that response. I think... The reason why these questions are important is because they demonstrate inconsistencies with fundamental ethical principles. And those inconsistencies arise and generate problems even if you're merely uncertain about whether the world is like this. Uh, And the fact that the world could in fact be like this means I think we should find these conflicts between fundamental ethical axioms quite troubling. Because you're going to have to give up one of those axioms then. 
And that's going to have ramifications on your ethical theory, presumably also in finite cases. Like if you rejected the Pareto principle, that could have like a huge effect on like which ethical principles you think are true in the finite case. But I do have sympathy for the concern. I don't think that this question is like an urgent one, for example. And so I don't think that people should necessarily be like pouring all of their time into it. Uh, I think it could be important because I think that ethics is important and this generates really important problems for ethics. Mm. But I don't necessarily think it's urgent. And so I think that one thing that people might be inclined to say is, oh, this is just so abstract and just doesn't matter. I tend to think it does matter. But the thing that you're maybe picking up on is it's possibly not urgent that we solve this problem. And I think that's probably correct. Okay, so let's come back to uh, your thesis Mm -hmm. and uh, trying to solve infinite ethics. Mm -hmm. So what kind of did you end up concluding with your thesis? Yeah, so I started out trying to solve the problems of infinite ethics, some of which I've indicated here and some of which, you know, exist in, in the literature. And I kept kind of hitting very similar problems. And the thing that I realized then is like, perhaps I have a kind of uh, impossibility result on my hands. And the the reason why I keep hitting these same problems is there's some fundamental tension here uh, that I can then try to identify. So I feel like I did identify that fundamental tension. And so this is between the Pareto principle, which I described earlier, which I think of as a very fundamental axiom in ethics. And this collection of uh, four kind of further axioms So the further axioms, one of them is a permutation principle, which just says that I can permute the populations of worlds and I can find other worlds where, you know, uh, some agents play different qualitative roles. So, for example, like I might play the role of an agent uh, three years from now or something like that instead of the the role that I play in this very world. I also have a a principle, which is uh, the claim that this at least as good as relation between worlds is a qualitative relation. So that just means that if I have two worlds, W1 and W2, and I have another pair of worlds that is a qualitative duplicate of that pair of worlds, W3 and W4, then W1 is at least as good as W2, if and only if W3 is at least as good as W4. Where qualitative duplicates just mean that kind of in all qualitative respects, um, so, you know, everyone's wearing the same color shorts, the sky is the same color, everyone has the same levels of well-being, etc., And this seems really plausible to me because the alternative would be that ethics has to be based on like non-qualitative facts and it's controversial, you know, the nature of non-qualitative facts, but basically that includes like, you know, who I am. So I care deeply about the fact that Obama is in a world. Um, That doesn't seem like it should matter whether it's Obama or just someone who's qualitatively identical to Obama. Um, And so it seems like ethics shouldn't care about such facts. And so I, I think that's a really plausible principle. And the other two that are also quite plausible are uh, transitivity. So, you know, it's not the case that world one is better than world two, world two is better than world three, and world three is better than world one. So it just prevents these cycles. And then the final axiom is uh, a kind of minimal completeness axiom, which just says it isn't the case that there's just ubiquitous incomparability between infinite worlds. Mm. And so because I was generating these kind of incomparability results from the first four axioms, um, Pareto, the permutation principle, the qualitativeness of the at least as good as relation and transitivity, we then can also accept those four axioms and the idea that we can kind of uh, get, offer uh, complete rankings of infinite worlds. And so we have a kind of case of genuine ethical incomparability with respect to infinite worlds. And that creates a lot of problems in subjective ethics, you know, the ethics of like permissibility. Uh, I think we get like analogous problems and it seems problematic in and of itself. It's not incomparability as a result of ignorance about the way that the world is. It's just that some worlds are just fundamentally incomparable ethically. You know, I then explore like what it means to give up one of these principles in ethics. But the key argument is we can't accept all of these things. So uh, there's a lot to deal with there. Does this uh, come back and have any implications for finite worlds as well? Yeah. So I think these puzzles affect finite ethics insofar as we even if we think that the world like has a very high probability of being uh finite we can still generate similar kind of puzzles for subjective permissibility so that is like you know what i should do given my uncertainty about the way that the world is if i'm just uncertain about whether the world is infinite or not and that's one way in which it could affect finite ethics Another, like, you know, slightly more abstract way that it could affect finite ethics is you might think that ethical theories are a lot like theories in physics, say. Mm. You know, so if you're uh, a moral realist, you might just think that something like utilitarianism or deontology is just akin to a theory about the way that the world is. 
And so if you find that in some ways that the world it could be, your theory completely breaks down, that's a kind of like failure of your theory. Mm-hmm. And I'm quite sympathetic to that, to the extent that, you know, this, this just means that I actually do get a little bit worried by these puzzles because I feel like the right ethical theory should be able to be kind of consistent with, with all of the ways that the world could be mm-hmm. that are kind of at least consistent with our laws of physics, say. And the fact that uh, a lot of our theories are not or are generating these problems is like concerning. So those are the two main respects in which I think it can affect and what you should do, even if you're very confident that the world is finite. Okay, so you listed those five five different things that we'd like to have, but yep. we can't have all five. Yeah. Uh, so which ones would you consider dropping? Uh, which ones are least painful and what would that imply? So this is a tricky question. Uh, I find each of these axioms highly plausible. Moreover, dropping many of them doesn't even help as much as you would want it to. So you might reject the Pareto Principle for example, uh, because you don't think the agents are this like special unit over which you should be kind of like uh, doing ethics. Maybe you think the subjective experiences are the thing that matter. But in fact, uh, you know, this kind of uh, worry is going to apply for things like subjective experiences too, uh, assuming you can identify like the same subjective experience across worlds. Mm -hmm. Or if you just care about subjective experiences, you know, you can end up being basically unable to rank infinite worlds anyway, because it's not clear how you could possibly uh, compare infinite worlds with infinitely many positive subjective experiences and infinitely many negative subjective experiences. So I like Preto and dropping it isn't just like obviously going to help you. The same is true of some of the other axioms, um, like the permutation principle. You might reject it for like various reasons, but we can actually accept weakened versions of it and generate the same puzzle. So I am kind of uncertain about which of these axioms I would give up. I really don't like it that we get non-comparability out of uh, these results. If I wanted to just avoid non-comparability, I might be inclined to say that we have to reject Pareto, but I really don't like that result. Because I think if you reject transitivity, you know, you just get cycles and ethics operates really badly if you just have like cyclical orderings. Um, The other principles seem really fundamental. Pareto is the other big ethical principle. Mm -hmm. And so... I don't want to give up Preto, but like that might be one way of getting around these problems. So accepting non-comparability is kind of like accepting defeat ethically, right? You're saying, well, just like everything's in- incomparable. I suppose in a sense, that's an ethical result, but it's also kind of a concession that ethics doesn't have anything to say. Yeah, at least in uh, a large number of worlds. You know, it could be the case that, you know, we find ways of like doing subjective ethics, you know, so... We say, yes, many of these infinite worlds are incomparable, but, you, you know, we have some credence that the universe is, is finite. And when the universe is finite, uh, we can compare worlds. And so you might be able to come up with subjective principles that kind of give a way of like screening off the worlds that you're uncertain over that are incomparable. So I generated problems for those theories at the, at the very end of my thesis. But I think that's like a, a kind of incomplete project, basically. And so like one thing that I would like to do going forward if I ever kind of get a chance to like work on this specific problem is to try and see what subjective principles we could try and use even if we kind of accept this incomparability result. Okay. And if we drop transitivity, mm-hmm. then we end up just with some other kind of nonsense outputs where we can't really we can't really say that something's better than something else because they're just running in circles. Yeah, you end up with cycles. And some people have tried to you know, have argued against transitivity and ethics. So it's not something that never occurs, but it can make it, I think, quite hard to generate principles that tell you what you ought to do. Mm. You know, so if I just say that one outcome is better than, you know, outcome one is better than outcome two is better than outcome three is better than outcome one. And, you know, what should you do? Yeah. What should I do in that case? And it's like, and it may just be that when you have these cyclical rank- rankings of the outcomes of your actions, that you just say all things are permissible or all things are impermissible. But, you know, that seems like a really bad result for ethics. Mm. And so we have these, you know, things that we want ethics to satisfy. And one of them is to say that, you know, it's not the case that just all actions are permissible. And so giving up transitivity means that you also have to, you know, you have this big task of then trying to generate these really plausible principles about what you ought to do. Okay. And it sounded like saying getting rid of Pareto would only help you in particular cases anyway, and is also pretty unpleasant because it, it, Pareto is so intuitive to you. Yeah. And and the other two conditions I don't actually understand, so I maybe won't follow up on those. <laughs> <laughs> but this sounds like it's a pretty bitter pill to swallow, what, the impossibility result here. Yeah. Um, so I guess you've made things worse. Or you've, you've solved the infinite ethics problem that I was concerned about before, but then uh, given us an even more more challenging one. 
Yeah, I think I did in my thesis just make things worse. That was the main outcome that I didn't I didn't want. But in some ways, just being clear on exactly what you can't have can be really helpful. Mm. So, you know, to be more charitable to the idea of giving up pre to over agents, you can just think that, you know, what we care about is like the amount of well-being at spatial temporal regions. Mm. And then we do actually have theories that can generate kind of rankings of actions that are like fairly intuitively acceptable if you think that that's what we're aggregating over. Basically, each person who has like a favored ethical theory or view of the world is going to say, yes, I don't like giving up any of these things, but I know what I'm going to give up. And so the people who already didn't like transitivity might give up transitivity in this case. The people who like aggregating over space time might just say, sure, I give up Pareto over agents because what I cared about was these space time regions. Yeah, I got to say, I I don't find Pareto that intuitive because I don't think of agents being fundamental. I just Mm -hmm. want to think of it as kind of like scattered experiences and the idea that like all of the experiences that are attached to kind of Rob. Yes. Yeah. just that, that, that that's some like natural grouping seems very strange to me. Yeah. And so I'm sympathetic to that view. I think the best theories that get around this problem that are like inconsistent with agent based Pareto principles are like these spatial temporal kind of region views. But if you have this view, which is like, oh, I don't actually care about like the amount of well-being, how it's distributed across space time but I do care about subjective experiences. It's actually super unclear how you can possibly rank infinite worlds because these subjective experiences have even less structure than agents do. You know, so suppose that each agent is composed of like thousands of subjective experiences and suppose that there's no way of identifying those experiences across worlds. So it's not the case that, you know, my experience right now can be identified with some other subjective experience um, that I could be having right now then it's just not clear how you can rank infinite worlds because most worlds are just going to contain infinite positive experiences, infinite negative experiences. That there's no ordering or correspondence exactly. between any of this. And yeah, yeah so that this, like, this subjective experiences view, I kind of am sympathetic to it uh, from a sort of philosophical point of view, but it's not clear that it helps us at all. <laughs> if anything, it just it, it it makes worse. us kind of throw up our hands and be like, I have no idea how to rank these worlds now um, because I have even less structure than agents or um, space time. It, it's a reason to reject Pareto, but it doesn't necessarily then give us like a, a you result. You just get up with walls. another impossibility proof. Yeah, um, and that's the concern. So uh, it seemed like earlier you might be gesturing towards a possible solution, which which would be to say that in infinite worlds everything is incomparable, and in finite worlds things potentially are comparable, mm-hmm. which would suggest that we should do that trick where we just imagine that the world is finite because if it's infinite then there's like nothing that we can do and then like try to maximize the world assuming that it's finite so we end up with kind of like infinity goggles where we're just like blind to any uh, infinite outcomes is is that an option yeah so you could just have a principle which says ignore all possibilities that the world is infinite so just care about the worlds that are finite and then suppose that i have two actions that i can undertake Uh, the first action will certainly improve the life of this one agent you know, Bob by like plus one. And uh, the other action, which is just not doing that thing, will not improve Bob's life. And now suppose that if the world is infinite, then not improving Bob's life will actually uh, make infinitely many agents better off than they would have been. And improving Bob's life will not. It has a guarantee of like not improving the lives of infinitely many agents. It seems like you should potentially just not improve Bob's life then. You know, you have some chance of making infinitely many agents better off. And if you don't find that plausible, then, you know, imagine like a, a chance of in, you know, rescuing infinitely many agents from hell or something like this. Um, it seems like infinities, you know, even small probabilities of them in a case like that um, should potentially trump. But if you just ignore infinities, you're going to end up saying just help Bob. So just don't care about um, all of these potential infinite benefits uh, or losses. Now, a different principle that you might have is one that says, OK, ignore the outcomes of your actions that are incomparable. So basically, if any action in any state generates a result that's incomparable with any other action in any other state, uh, then ignore that. And this leads to like a bunch of other uh, puzzles that I kind of uh, discuss a little bit. I mean, an obvious one might just be that it's not clear that there is always going to be any action that you're not uh, just going to ignore uh, the outcomes of in that case. You know, we can imagine that for every action, there is some other action such that the outcomes of both of the actions are incomparable in at least one possible state of the world. Mm. Um, and so then it would be like, OK, I, I actually just there's no action that there's like no outcome that I actually pay attention to here. So for reasons that I probably go into like more detail and elsewhere, I think that like these puzzles uh, come up and it's just very difficult to actually generate very good principles which tell you what to ignore without having really bad further consequences. 
So this all sounds uh, like a council of despair to some extent. Uh (laughs) Um, How much of an update is this against moral realism or naturalism or at least against consequentialism? Yeah, so the interesting thing for me is that I think that this affects all moral theories and not just consequentialism because uh, the impossibility result is going to apply to just any theory. And of course, some theories are are going to like, like bite different bullets. So if you're like an absolutist deontologist, you might just say, I should just ignore the fact that my action might harm infinitely many people if in performing the action, you know, it's like I'm kind of satisfying some duty that I have, say. Um, But I think that's like a real problem. You know, a lot of people think that um, things like the uh, case where uh, you have to tell, you know, the Nazi that comes to your door where you're hiding like Jews like because you're like obligated not to to lie to them. I mean, a lot of people think that that's a really terrible counterexample to like Kant's theory. And I'm like inclined to agree. I think that's like a terrible thing to do. And this is to say like, yes, and you shouldn't even care if you're saving the lives of like infinitely many people. And I think that would also be like a really bad result. Mm. So you can bite bullets, but I think, you know, every moral theory has to face the fact that like, you know, when our actions like affect potentially infinitely many people, we're going to have to give up some plausible axiom or some axiom that at least most people think are, think is plausible. And so that is a kind of general worry for kind of ethical theories. Uh, should it make us like more inclined to, to be kind of anti-realist, say, or just to think that uh, this is like a real blow to ethics? And I'm not sure. I do think that I updated slightly away from something like moral realism on the basis of this, because it starts to look like you can't have a moral theory that has all of the properties that you want I don't know how much of an update it was, but it was like a partial update for me, I guess, and a partial update away from uh, consequentialist theories as well. So I guess given that it's only a partial update, it sounds like uh, you think there's a possibility that you're mistaken or that someone else in the future will come up with a more satisfactory resolution of of these issues that will make it uh, work again on some (laughs) moderately intuitive level. Yeah, or just that, you know, given that these impossibility results, you know, when you get impossibility results in ethics, they do affect everyone. And they are just showing that there are certain axioms that we just can't jointly satisfy. And so I don't think that people are going to be able to show that you can somehow jointly satisfy those axioms. Um, You know, I think one of the things that's happening in this literature is that you're really showing that certain uh, axioms are just fundamentally in tension with one another. We might discover there are actually like, you know, ways of giving up one of these axioms that are much more palatable. Mm -hmm. You know, so an example might be, you know, just to generate a kind of possible one is like we find a really good way of dealing with intransitivity and ethics you know we just say actually intransitivity is is correct and but here's like a really good decision theory for what you should do when there are like these intransitive orderings so that's why it's kind of like a partial update is is more that like we don't yet know what the best theories that are like only consistent with some of these axioms are going to look like and they could actually look quite good Okay, so before we started here, I was expecting to uh, worry that infinite ethics would lead to some kind of um, moral fanaticism where mm-hmm. people would just be trying to create infinite amounts of good and they wouldn't care about anything else. But it seems like we've gone almost in the exact opposite direction. We wish that we like had such a strong conclusion that we could uh, work with, but yeah. in fact, it's just it's just leading to incomparability in, in, in lots of uh, reasonable worlds. Yeah, in many ways, like I do worry about fanaticism concerns. You know, this idea that I should just only care about like really small probabilities potentially of uh, infinite value over like really high probabilities of finite value. That seems bad to me. But then as I have kind of worked on this stuff, you know, I'm like, actually, we have a problem just generating a a kind of ranking of uh, actions or outcomes in infinite worlds. So I'm like, well, first we need to worry about generating any ranking. Then we need to kind of worry about the plausibility of that ranking. And ideally, you know, we at the very end, we somehow come up with like a plausible a plausible and complete ranking uh, is the kind of goal. But yeah, we're seeing problems for doing any of that. So this is like what I think of as the as the key problems in infinite ethics at the moment. Yeah, we're, we're more paralyzed than fanatical. Yeah. Would you be able to, in, in infinite worlds, would you possibly be able to make comparisons between like really simple and boring worlds, like one with an infinite number of positive experiences and one with an infinite number of negative experiences? Sure, There's there are spaces where, you know, and this is why if, uh, you know, if the causal ramifications of your actions are like finite, then we can, we can rank worlds. Mm-hmm. Because we can have principles which say, yes, if you, you know, if, if one world is better than another by Pareto, then it's simply better. You get these like mild extensions of Pareto, which just say that if it's better for infinitely many people and worse for finitely many people, then the first world is better. You know, as long as 
it's actually infinite utility and not uh, they're not better off by some infinitesimal amount, for example. So there are these worlds that are comparable by Pareto or like very mild extensions of them. And the concern that you have is that these are not very, you know, if you just take the, the space of all like possible worlds or all kind of like random walk worlds, these are not going to be very common. If the world is is finite, if you can be certain that it's finite, then you just happen to be in a little pocket of those comparable worlds. Um, and so, yes, like, you know, if you suddenly became certain that the world is finite, then our kind of standard theories for like comparing infinite worlds would actually like just generate complete rankings and would be like, here you go. Here's the action you should undertake. So uh, what does infinite ethics mean, if anything, for kind of priorities for the effective altruism community or listeners' day-to-day actions? Yeah, I mean, I kind of like to think that it doesn't mean too much. Um, So I think these are very interesting puzzles, and I hope that they show people that, like, we can find these very kind of fascinating uh, problems with ethical theories in physically possible worlds. I do think that it means that, you know, these things might be important to sort out in the long term in the same way that like any major problem for uh, a kind of scientific theory is like really interesting and important to sort out in the long term. But it doesn't necessarily mean that um, you should be working on something different right now. And so I think that one possible kind of caveat to that is that, you know, it might mean that work that allows us to do this work in the future is a bit more important. So if you think that there are the really important unresolved problems, um, then things that give you the space at some point in the future to like research this stuff can be like more important. Okay. Yeah. So we shouldn't uh, strongly commit to something that prevents us from further reflecting on infinite ethics or indeed like all of these inf- uh, like uh, ethical paradoxes. Yes. But, yeah, yeah, exactly. You want to like leave this space of research open and that's like quite important. And yeah. these issues might not be urgent, but like at some point it would be really nice to like work through and resolve all of them. Um, and so you want to make sure that you kind of like leave space for that and you don't kind of commit to like one theory being true in this case. And I think that the lessons of impossibility theorems in ethics that are important are mainly that like ethics is hard and that you shouldn't kind of act as if like one ethical theory or principle or set of principles is definitely true because there are like a lot of inconsistencies between really plausible ones and so i think that's like a more general principle that one should uh, kind of live by and maybe these impossibility results like just kind of strengthen that okay uh so i mean i mean your, your thesis is uh, is is very long and you've got a bunch of yes, papers that are, that are going to come out of this <laughs> so, so so in a sense we've like we've only talked about kind of one result uh, i guess or you know the most important yeah. result um and we'll stick up a link to uh you know a bunch of a bunch of papers mm. uh, or like draft papers and your thesis on this topic if yeah. that's okay so um the, the listeners who are, who are keen for more can uh yeah. can go and check that out Let's talk a bunch about philosophy as a, as a career. Yep. Uh, so I guess most listeners are not about to become ac- academic philosophers, yep. but, but a few of them might, and mm-hmm. uh, people might be interested to learn what that kind of lifestyle is like. So what do you think people kind of misunderstand about our careers in philosophy? I think this is, this is a hard question because it depends a lot on like the assumptions that people have going in. So my impression now is that there are far fewer jobs in philosophy than there used to be and that there are like a lot of philosophy PhDs coming out. And so I think maybe something like the difficulty of that process and also like how demanding and competitive it is. So you're going to have to dedicate, you know, I spent two years doing a master's, six and a half years doing a PhD. If I want to be an academic philosopher, I'd probably have to do a postdoc to like spend some time like publishing the things that I've already written. Then, you know, you've got like the same amount of time doing tenure track and a huge amount of your time during tenure track is going to be with teaching and admin and a relatively small amount of time researching and researching in order to publish enough to get tenure, which means publishing in good journals, which means that the topics that you write in are kind of determined by what can be published in a journal. And obviously I'm mainly talking to like how I perceive the US system to be at the moment. One thing I've worried about is if you really want to focus on doing like effective research, for example, like are these jobs as conducive to that as you think? And it's like, yeah, be aware that you might not spend as much of your time as you think like doing that work. And so I think that's, yeah, that's one issue that people might, uh, people might just have this image of you just sitting doing research all the time and researching whatever you want. And I think that's like probably not true until you're like quite senior in your career. Yeah. Do you think more people should be trying to become philosophers or fewer? I mean, I think fewer, 
by like quite a long way, I guess. Um, my impression of the job market is that there are a lot more like temporary posts, uh, a lot more adjuncting positions and like fewer permanent positions um, and that there are a lot of people still going into PhD programs. And so, yeah, I think it's very tough for people right now. And yeah, like I don't know the numbers. So I need to go and look at the numbers of basically how many PhDs in philosophy are produced each year and now how many like jobs that were the jobs that people wanted going into their PhD, which will probably not be adjuncting jobs and temporary positions, but will be like tenure track jobs. How many of those exist? Um, and I wouldn't be surprised if the numbers were kind of like horrifying. And so, yeah, I think that it's it's tough to like recommend this career path, I guess, if that's the case, which it almost certainly is. Yeah. Is, I mean, is there a case for doing a philosophy PhD, even if you think you're probably not going to get one of these one of these desirable academic jobs at the end? Yeah. So like, you know, there's a question of like um, what people do after their PhD. And then, you know, a, a key question there is also what they could do otherwise. You know, so I think you can do things with a PhD in philosophy. It can be a little bit tough because I think a lot of people don't know what philosophers do. You know, so like the work that I do often intersects really strongly with economics, for example. And so like I feel a bit more comfortable, like sometimes I'll just describe my research as like kind of on the border of economics because it makes people kind of engage with the, the kind of questions that I'm going to be engaging with. But philosophy is like so broad as a discipline that, you know, if you say that you've got a PhD in philosophy, that could mean that you've been doing work on like free will or that you've been doing work on like neuroscience or that you've been doing work in physics or that you've been doing work in like decision theory. And so I think it can be tough because people don't necessarily know what you've done and people, there's not like a good model uh, for like a PhD in philosophy. And I also suspect that given that cost, if one can do a PhD in like another discipline that is more tailored to like uh, whatever they want to do, if that's not an academic job, that's probably going to be an advantage. So, you know, if you know you want to work for like a think tank for which an economics PhD would be really useful. It's like you could potentially do that with a philosophy PhD, but it seems like it's probably going to be easier with a more tailored PhD. And so if you don't want to go into academic philosophy, I think there will be often kind of an alternative degree that is like better. I guess it's just also an enormous time investment. It's a huge uh, time investment. And you're not getting paid in the meantime. It's like, I mean, it's quite a difficult lifestyle, it sounds yeah. like. I mean, you get paid, uh, yeah, you get your you get your graduate stipend, but you're relative to like what you would be earning. It's probably extremely low. I so, mean, you know. so I mean, even if you're just trying to kind of gain skills and credibility, it might be possible to get more of that at less cost somewhere else. I would imagine. Yeah, and especially like, yeah, if you think about because a lot of the programs are tailored towards academic teaching, or like at least being able to teach, you have to do a broad array of like courses, for example. So you'll come out like. Ideally, in a lot of the programs, you know, you'll come out with a really broad knowledge of like the subject matter. You know, you'll have to have done metaphysics, you'll have to have done history philosophy, you'll have to have done value theory, you'll have to have done some film math, you'll have to have done logic, because you have to be able to teach all of these areas. And if you think that you're not going to want to become an academic, this is like highly tailored training uh, for something that you might never use again. And sure, that like builds up general skills. Like philosophy is really great for like being able to analyze arguments and being able to clarify concepts and and be able to reason generally. But is there like a more efficient way to do that than to get like a five to seven year PhD? I suspect that there is. Um, and so, yeah, I think that for a lot of jobs that are like not academic philosophy, there are just going to be like better things you could do than a philosophy program. So... You're basically at the end of your PhD now, yeah. um, and you're leaving with uh, like a very prestigious credential, uh, graduating from from NYU. And as listeners can hear, you're very smart. Um, so you've probably got a lot of different options in front of you. So you could you could try to go into philosophy now, mm -hmm. um, become an academic. I guess try to become a public intellectual or something like that. Do yeah. some kind of advocacy work. Yeah. Um, I guess you could also become a researcher in an effective altruist organization like mm -hmm. OpenPhil. Yeah. Are there some other like options that are at the top of your mind at the moment? I mean, also, you can, you know, you can end up doing research that's relevant to industries, for example. So if you end up doing technology research, this could be like relevant to technology companies. Um, so I think people shouldn't like rule that out as uh, if you, even if you're a researcher or like going into think tanks um, that you just think are like really important, but not necessarily like effective altruist and kind of intent or whatever. Those are the kinds of areas that I can, you know, I think that are in the kind of uh, options available. So I guess, how, how are you going to weigh these up? It'd be interesting to kind of walk through the decision that you are making now, even though like, you, know, you, might, end up, you yeah. might not want to share all of your thoughts, yeah, but, yeah. but we can at least like, uh, survey some of the considerations uh, so people can see how, how you think this through. 
do you see becoming an academic as potentially high impact? I think that becoming an academic can be high impact kind of uh, like long term. And also like, you know, you have a lot of interaction with students and that can be like quite impactful, I imagine. But I do think, I think that like things like uh, via the kind of public intellectual route or where you do important work uh, often like kind of later on in your career or when you're more senior, that's the kind of route to impact for a lot of academics, I think is like, or at least to clarify, I guess, I think that's probably true of philosophy academics, but that's mainly because philosophy academics are less likely to interact directly with say other fields and with uh, policy. There are lots of fields like economics and just policy where uh, academics can actually have like a big influence on things like policy and Mm. and governance. And so that's the reason why I say I think philosophy is like more like a kind of public intellectual heavy uh, impact, basically. So, yeah, how does going into academia compare with working at an effective altruist kind of organization or in a think tank or in a foundation where you that you feel kind of shares your values? I think this is like a really hard question to answer because there's like a high route to impact via like doing important academic work especially important academic work that like is accessible to the public um and it's you're in a kind of better position to do that if you're working you know within the kind of university system but it could also be the case that there are some really important and kind of urgent research topics that we just need people kind of working on like now um and then figuring out the best way to like continue working on those topics even if it's not within academic departments at least in the short term So I guess my plan is to spend some time doing research in the topics that I think are really important and then to figure out what I'm best at out of the topics that are really important and like where I think I would have the largest impact and then to use that to guide the decision that I then make, you know, so if it's the case that I can do that better, you know, within a kind of academic post, then that's what I would aim for. And if I think it's like I could do it better at other organizations, then that's what I'd aim for. You mentioned kind of working in technology companies or mm-hmm. or in policy. Are, are there any specific options that you have uh, in mind there? No, I mean, I'm. if anything, I'm like, at least I feel like I'm kind of putting my money where my mouth is when it comes to like value of information and the explore exploit trade off, where I think that when you start to work for somewhere with a fairly prescribed role, in many ways, you're in exploit mode because you have to then work within the confines of the role that you've selected. Whereas if you're not sure about what the best thing for you to be doing is, I think it can make more sense to have a kind of exploratory period where you kind of explicitly don't commit to like a given role in order to be in a better position to like be able to go to someone later and say, this is what I think I'm really good at. This is what I think is really important. Do you think it's important? Do you want someone working on this? And then going into kind of exploit mode and like doing that thing. And so the main thing that I'm trying to do at the moment is like actually leave my options completely open and have this phase where I can like explore really important topics and see if I can do good work in those areas. Okay. So it sounds like for a while now you're planning to not really make any commitments and instead just work on writing what you think is most important. Making no commitments is probably like a bit too strong and it's not like I'm going to work on anything. So I've mainly like done some research into the topics that I think are going to be potentially really important. And I will like work on those topics in the kind of like uh, near term and see if see if I'm any good at it, basically. Yeah. Um, so it's not like, yeah, I'm not like going off and you know, doing research into like, you know, the best shape of surfboards or <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm sure there's already a lot of research in that and I probably can't contribute much to it. Yeah, actually, um, more, almost certainly much more than on infinite ethics. Yeah. <laughs> um, but hold on, when you finish a PhD, don't you usually have to kind of immediately apply for academic jobs? You usually would apply in the fall. And so like a big question for me is like whether I will apply in the fall. And so I think that there's some chance I would apply for like postdoctoral positions in the fall, but not necessarily tenure track jobs. And there's some chance I just won't apply for anything. And in many ways, this feels like, you know, I feel like I'm kind of exposing myself a little bit here because it feels very risky to me. There's this idea that academia, or at least within philosophy, is very punitive of people who leave for any given period of time. Um, And so if there's like a kind of gap where you weren't, um, people will assume that you were like applying for jobs and not getting jobs, or they'll assume that you're not somehow like committed to academia. And this always seems like really negative to me because I'm like, if someone goes away and spends some time thinking about what they want to do, and then they come to the conclusion that actually these academic jobs are the right thing for them, they're in many ways in like a much better position than someone who just applied because it was the thing that was expected of them. Mm -hmm. But I think it's like, yeah, it's like risky. But yeah, if I was going to apply, I'd have to apply in the fall. And at the moment, it's looking more likely that I like won't do that. So 
Uh, it sounds like uh, one of the most important things for you at the moment is kind of keeping your options open and being able to, to go into other paths or reverse track. Yeah. That's right. Uh, how much do you decide between the, uh, how much do you think you'll decide between these options based on their expected social impact? Is that kind of a top consideration for you or just like one of several? Uh, I think for me, it's now the top consideration. I think I'm at the moment not making career decisions that are self-interested. And I think I'm taking like on risks that I wouldn't otherwise take if I didn't think that actually this was like just the way to do the most good. Yeah. What, what kinds of risks are you referring to? So I think things like um, poten- the potential uh, of like not applying for academic jobs is like a big one. It's just like the thing that I've optimized my life for since I was, I guess, like, I mean, at least since I was in my early 20s, like maybe since I was 21. And also I'm like much happier to to not have like stable employment uh, in order to have this ability to like explore topics a little bit more. Hmm. And I think I wouldn't have been happy with that. I think I really tried to like internalize the idea that I should just be trying to do a bunch of good with my career. And I think if I hadn't, then my career path would be like quite different at the moment. You'd be kind of playing it safe and doing that. I'd be playing it much more safe. Yeah, I think I'm naturally extremely risk averse with my career. Mm -hmm. And I think some people are, and it can be like quite damaging in some ways. Um, And so I'm trying to be much more like risk neutral Mm -hmm. than I would otherwise be. So when you're thinking about the options you have in front of you, like what are some of the key questions that you have for trying to figure out like which one of them is going to be highest impact? You know, so I've often been kind of thinking about research and I should potentially like branch out from that it's hard for me to get out of the kind of research mindset but often it's uh like how important is this topic how important is it that we solve it really soon you know i think academics can be kind of inclined to go towards whatever is interesting as a puzzle and um if it also seems important that's great and it's like well actually you shouldn't care as much about whether it's interesting or not and it can be important but not urgent um and instead we should be focusing on a mix of like urgency and importance um, so I think I tend to think about that and then I combine it with, uh, and what am I good at? And what are my skills? It might be that I'm like, you know, better at say communicating ideas and that there's like a, if there's like a lack of good, just write ups of things that uh, are clear, then you have this like opportunity to like come in and, and fill that gap, I guess. So it's like figuring out what I'm best at plus what I think is like important and urgent research topics. Makes sense. Yeah. How uh, do you kind of figure out what is your comparative advantage or what's what's the best personal fit? I think it's a mix of like, I often just ask people, uh, I suppose. <laughs> like, is the, <laughs> what do they think you'd be good at? Or just like, I do think, you know, you do things and then you get feedback from yeah. people that's of the form. Like, oh, that thing was really good. Or like, we've got a million people who are already good at this other thing. Mm. And you're also good at it. But like, mm. you know, like whatever, it's not a um, particularly amazing uh, skill. You know, plus like uh, a terrible, probably a a really high amount of like intuition. And, you know, I think other people often explicitly reason more than I do. I Mm. often think that my implicit reasoning brain is like a little bit stronger than my uh, than my explicit reasoning brain and lets it do some of the work. When it comes to these kind of practical decisions. When it comes to just most things, I often (laughs) just think that I solve all my research problems like while like, you know, sleeping or something um, Mm. or just like while like, you know, walking down the street thinking about like flowers or something um so my i just feel like the the thing that's churning in the background is the thing that's doing most of the work sometimes yeah so you're very interested in exploration and kind of flexibility uh but how much how much are you also thinking about like which uh, next roles will skill you up the most uh, again getting my skills oh this is like a big you know like i'm explicitly trying to like carve out a bunch of time in my life to to like both like explicitly learn about things that are relevant to the research that i want to do but also i'm really trying to explore new areas for me because it just seems like like extremely important that I get a sense of like how much I would have to to learn to be really up to date in like you know various important topics, um, and I like have a kind of strong I, I strongly favor things that I think would increase my skill set. You know, so I'm much more inclined to like uh, I'm much more inclined to work on research topics that I think are like at the edge of my ability to do than research topics that I feel very comfortable with and think are important just because I get much more information plus I like actually learn some skills along the way. Uh, having invested so much time though in like formal education do you just feel like now's the time to kind of cash out and do something rather than focusing on uh, on getting getting better or? Strangely not but this is because I've just done the PhD and so like I feel like I've spent several years now just like I have been learning things but the process isn't one of you know like when you learn about a new area it's just like 
it's like learning a skill. You just, you, you go from being terrible to pretty good really quickly. And then you go from being pretty good to really, really, really good incredibly slowly. So I feel like I've been, I've had this topic where I'm trying to go from pretty good to like really, really, really good. And that's like what a lot of the PhD is. Um, and so you're getting like kind of really diminishing returns in terms of what you're learning because you're having to like do this thing of uh, kind of getting to the peak of understanding and getting to the edge of, of, a, of a given literature, say, and like saying new things. So I love the kind of learning that is just like going back to things I know very little about because it's just like super satisfying. So, yeah, no, I'm like almost the opposite where I'm like, I want to learn a bunch of things that I'm just terrible at now. Uh, so kind of what uh, properties of the jobs that you consider taking uh, matter other than their social impact? What are the most important other considerations for you? I think that sometimes we can be a bit, I at least can be a little bit indifferent to like sort of my own needs and have a failure to recognize that that can really impact on my life in a negative way. So things like having security, like having job security, having like some income security, having things like health insurance, I can kind of ignore those things until I realize that I actually can't do good work without some sense of like psychological security that I'm like not going to like have no job and no place to stay in like a few months. And so I think that for me, realizing that was like, okay, I actually should focus a little bit more on making sure that I'm just like secure. Um, just cause it's, I mean, it's the kind of scatterbrained philosopher thing of just like not thinking about this and then being like, Oh, like actually I'm it's hard to anxious. Yeah. Why, yeah, why am I, anxious? yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, Oh like, yeah. Um, uh, it's like maybe because like I forgot to buy health insurance and, uh, and like, <laughs> I could be fired at any moment. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And like, I have no backup plan and all this kind of stuff. So yeah, I think for me, it's a mix of like creating a space where I can actually do good work. And that involves like taking care of like your basic human needs. And I'm trying to be a bit more attentive to that than I have been in the past. Yeah, so I'm slowly learning. Okay, so uh, you talked a bit about the urgency of questions, mm -hmm. which I guess um, you're thinking like questions can be important to solve, but they don't have to be solved right now. They yeah. have to be solved by this generation where there's other questions where even if they're not so important, we need to know the answers immediately yeah. because they're, they're guiding, guiding our current decisions. What do you think are kind of the, the most urgent like research questions, perhaps within philosophy or related areas? Yeah, so I think that um, some things that I think are going to be really important and that are getting increased attention are things like ethics and policy questions surrounding uh, new technology. So I know that you had Miles talk about AI policy, and I think that's like a really prime example of an area that I think is going to be like really increasingly important, but also strikes me as urgent in the sense that you know, it would be good to have more people like working on that like right now. I think other questions that are going to be that are important and somewhat urgent could be really questions that relate to things like cause prioritization and like how to decide like which causes to to focus on and some of that is like kind of abstract work and some of it is more concrete you know so i've talked in kind of abstract terms about like value of information but i'm like uh insofar as like actually working out like how much information you get from either investing in or doing research in a given topic is valuable and important, it would be really nice to be able to quantify that. And so there are a bunch of questions around like where you should actually like focus your resources that I think could be really important and it would be really good to have people working on them like right now. Um, so those are the two ones that kind of strike me as like important kind of direct research questions. And then there are other ones where I think that like the communication of them could be important. So maybe some stuff in population ethics or like things about the long run future and arguments in favor of focusing on it. Um, I like it when I see people working on both those questions and also like communicating them in a way that's like clear and makes the arguments like explicit. So it seems like in choosing between the options in front of you, you're likely to, to end up doing research. And the question is kind of, where do you want to be doing that research? Yeah. And you've got something of a, some kind of trade-offs between perhaps like the prestige of the organization you're associated with and like what topics you can study and what kind of freedom you have to, to work on different things and, and like where you have to publish and who you have to impress. Like, uh, so what, what, are the, what are the considerations that you have in mind there? Yeah, so I think that like a lot of people talk about the importance of like research freedom. Um, and by that, they mean something like the freedom to just like work on just any topic that you want. But I think it's kind of important to note that even within like academic jobs, that doesn't strike me as the kind of freedom that you have, because there's this constraint of having to publish and having to like publish in top journals within your field. And the things that are just acceptable papers uh, in top journals in your field might be a fairly kind of constrained set of topics. And so 
you know, by research freedom there, you don't mean like I can literally work on anything because if you want to get tenure, you know, you're going to have to work on uh, topics that are publishable. And I think it's similar even if you're trying to do research outside of this like traditional kind of like outside of like universities or for like organizations, for example, the question isn't something like, do I have complete autonomy over what I research? Uh, rather like it are my like values and what I want to work on aligned with like this organization and will I be able to do the work that I think is really important within this kind of uh, role that I have and that could mean that you have more research freedom at like a think tank that is like more aligned with your values than you will at like an academic department where technically you can work on anything Mm -hmm. just because at the think tank you can actually like write papers that you think are like great and important but that no journal in your field would publish Um, and if that's the case Like, you know, then it feels like you have more freedom to work on on uh, the things that you really want to work on. And so I think that, like, it can be easy to think of research freedom as just this thing, which is like, yeah, I just wake up in the morning and I write on anything that I want to write on. Um, And instead, I think it's like, no, I always want my writing and my work to be useful for some end. And it's just where can you like do the best work that's actually useful for like a community or like the think tank you're working for or just like for whatever ends like your research is like intended to kind of meet. And that's not always going to mean that you have the most freedom in an academic job. It might mean that you have more freedom working within a fairly constrained, you know, position in a think tank, for example. So I think it's like really important to bear that in mind that it can, yeah, it can just be easy to hear research freedom and think this kind of naive, do what you want. Um, And I just don't think that's how I kind of conceive of it, I guess. Yeah, I was actually thinking the reverse, that probably academia would have the greatest constraints on you, like along the lines you're saying. Whereas if you could find, I mean, if you can find a private organization that shares your values or like a donor who uh, like wants to fund what you actually care about, uh, then then in some ways it's easier to do it a bit more as an independent agent or as part of an organization that you've specifically chosen for this purpose. Yeah. And you can also get that within academia. Like you are getting an increasing number of organized, you know, of, of like academic institutions, you know, that are like... Um, you know, effective altruist affiliated or uh, are trying to do work in important areas. Um, So it's not to say that you can't do it within uh, academic departments, but at least if you're going into like jobs in the US, I think my big worry with that is just that you have this pressure to publish and to publish in top journals and until you have tenure. And that means that like, you know, for like five to seven years you're really constrained by writing on the topics that are publishable within those journals and if you have a really important paper that's like practically relevant on like how to assess value of information of an intervention to use like one of the examples from earlier um, and you just can't get it published and you know it's not publishable it's going to be really hard for you to like work on that paper in fact you might just need to set it aside and so yeah I think that like in many ways you can have like more freedom just going somewhere that's like um, a bit more aligned with like your values, w- whether within academia or like outside of it, I guess. It sounded like, like me, you're very interested in uh, technology and strategies around like the, the development of new technologies, you know, AI yep. being kind of uh, the most prominent example. Yep. Can you imagine working on that, like going into an organization that's focused on AI specifically? Oh yeah. I mean, this is like the topic that I'm like primarily at least like moving my research into mm-hmm. at the moment. I think there are like a lot of issues, both in kind of ethics and policy surrounding artificial intelligence that are like tractable and important and interesting and that like I kind of look forward to working on and that I've like started doing, you know, some like research on already. Um, And so, yeah, I'm like very interested in those areas and like... You're kind um, of dipping your toe in the water at the moment. Yeah. And I mean, I have been, yeah, I have been dipping my toe in and like hope to just basically like start doing like a lot of kind of research in in that area. So I've noticed that Friends of mine who studied philosophy seem to be like very clear thinkers and unusually clear communicators. Do you think that's because uh, they learned a lot while studying philosophy or were they just unusually rational to begin with? I think this is actually like an incredibly hard question to answer kind of a priori, because obviously there's definitely a kind of selection effect. If you just like analyzing arguments, coming up with counter arguments, and you're attracted to kind of like that clear kind of rigorous uh, style of thinking then philosophy can be a kind of attractive field but I also think that sometimes the extent to which that's like a selection effect can be a bit overplayed so I've certainly had like students I tend to like when I'm teaching I just think that it's easy for people to just think people either get it or they don't and that's because the people teaching are the people who just got it they just understood from the, you know, they, they naturally, they took to like philosophy, like a duck to water. 
And so when they see students struggling, they just can't really empathize with why they would be struggling. And one thing I found really interesting when teaching is just that I tried to like really, if I felt like a student wasn't understanding something, really see why they might not understand it and not assume it's just some natural inability. And the amount of times you can actually make like a huge amount of progress with someone by doing that, by just realizing there's something fundamental that they're not quite seeing or getting and then like helping them get that thing and then see them make a huge amount of progress made me a bit more inclined to think, yeah, maybe we're actually doing something that's like um, helping people to like see something that some people just see naturally, like the structure of an argument and like trying to find, I like love trying to find ways of like breaking down arguments that are kind of different to, so that they like meet different people's understanding and styles, you know, so like very often, you know, we do, I, I think I once talked about this as kind of sequences versus clouds where the idea was we teach arguments sometimes like they're these series of like deductions and they're these kind of linear things like, P, if P, then Q, like, therefore Q, like Q, if and only if R, therefore R, you know, we, and we do this in a kind of sequence. And for a lot of people, it's better to take an argument that someone gives, say, in a newspaper, take the conclusion and then just like negate the conclusion. So say it's false and then put all of their assertions back into this cluster and like ask them, does this cluster look consistent? And if the cluster looks consistent, they can actually say, hey, the argument is not valid because I could actually have all of your premises and not your conclusion. And if the cluster does look does look inconsistent, then say to them, okay, and what's the least likely thing out of this cluster? And then if it's not the, the negated conclusion that they pull out, they've got a counter argument. You know, it's like, okay, that's the premise you disagree with. And it's not like a big thing. It's just like a way to reconceptualize an argument. And I find sometimes when you just do that with people, some people just have that way of thinking. And so like just you know, appealing to that rather than this like sequential way of thinking can actually like really help people. And so I think I'm actually a bit more of an optimist of like, I don't think that we necessarily teach people by just teaching them logic. I think we just expose them to a bunch of arguments again and again and again, and give them some tools to like be able to analyze arguments. Um, and that that can actually like, I think, you know, and it's just a hypothesis could be totally false, but it feels like actually people can make like progress on this. And it's not just something that people are kind of born with. Our final question is, um, I guess you're leaving something like 25 years, possibly 26 years of, of formal education. Mm -hmm. Have you like learned any tips that people can use to be, to be more successful within the cocoon of school and, uh, and, and university? So like, I think something that people find strange, and I'm never sure whether to admit to this. I used to, uh, I didn't have to take many exams when I was like younger and when I was like an undergraduate. Um, but when I did, I found them kind of terrifying. And so one thing that I would do is I would try and figure out say that the exam I knew would have like, uh, you know, 10 questions or something, and I'd have to answer three. I would try and figure out like maybe six of the answers that were, or six of the questions that were going to, to probably come up. And then I would just write full, full essay answers to those questions. <laughs> and I would just try and memorize those essays. And I have like quite a good- Word for word. Word for word. <laughs> um, and I have a really good text memory. Uh, like I have a very poor memory in many respects, but I can often remember things that I've written and read. And uh, this actually, at least I remember in at least one exam, which will remain nameless, I basically just wrote out essays that I had already just memorized before I went in because I just didn't want to like feel nervous in the exam. The questions that I thought would come up came up and I just wrote out my memorized answers. So it's like with exams, you maybe don't always need to go in there and like just demonstrate your ability. Maybe you can just memorize a bunch of text and then go, that you've already written and then go in and just like write it out. It's an incredible um, combination of like mental ability and inability. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> at least knowing your weaknesses. You're just like, mm. I don't act well when I'm like when I'm nervous things go badly. I'm going to be nervous in this exam. So I'm going to utilize this other ability, which is this memorization. And then I'm just going to like use that to like help me through this process. Did you do well in the exam? I did pretty well in the exam. Yeah, good. Um, good. yeah I think it was like, uh, I think I was happy with the result of this, this method. Okay. I guess that's um, a great suggestion there for any listeners who are very stupid, but have an incredible memory. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think very stupid is like the correct description there. <laughs> Get, very, maybe, get, get bad exam yeah, nerves is maybe yeah, yeah. more accurate. Um, my guest today has been uh, Amanda <laughs> Askell. Thanks for coming on the show, Amanda. Thanks for having me. Just a reminder to check in on whether you want to read those articles about being a congressional staffer, how often you should just give up on things, whether you can guess which psychology studies have true findings, and whether it's important to play to your comparative advantage.
The 80,000 Hours podcast is produced by Kieran Harris. Thanks for joining. Talk to you next week.